other one for the final calendar application. Okay, I have the recording going. Uh, Rick, are you ready to record? Let's see. Hey, Rick. Oh, Rick. Sure. Okay, thanks, Rick. Okay, good evening. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Montclair Township Zoning Board of Adjustment. Notice of this meeting has been published in the paper, uh, as well as published on our website and posted on our bulletin board at the Township of Montclair. Um, this meeting uh, has been, um, I don't have my work. Um, published in accordance with the requirements of the P Open Public Meetings Act. And uh, you can follow the, the information on how to join our meeting, um, which is an online remote meeting, uh, by looking at our agenda, which is uh, available for view on the website and on the screen of uh, TV 34. I guess I go into roll call. Mr. Harrison? Here. Mr. Fleischer? Here. Mr. Church? Mr. McCullough? Here. Mr. Moore? Mr. Allen? Mr. Simon? He's, he's muted. Uh, Mr. Simon, I see you're on the phone. Okay, good. Ms. Harris? Here. Mr. Caulfield? Here. And Ms. Gilmer? Here. Okay. okay. We have the minutes of the October 21st meeting. I don't have any changes. Does anyone else have any changes? Yes, I have a change. I don't think Mr. Petto was here for the last meeting. Did I no, miss something? No, no, he wasn't. He has to okay, so he's shown on the roll call as being present. Right. And Ms. Talley is called is shown calling the roll but not being present per se. So I think that would be the substitution, Ms. Talley, for Mr. Petto. Yep. Move approval of the minutes as as modified. Sir, sir. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We have to, okay, Janice, you had on the agenda a resolution for the extension on Orange Road. Which I, I did not get a chance to actually write that resolution, so I think I'm gonna put that on for the next agenda. Okay. And we have the resolution. Hold on. Hold on. Um, I'm going to. There's a lot of noise in the background, so I'm just going to unmute everybody else except for you, Bill. Okay. That's and then we're going to have to. Quit. Okay. Um, we have the resolution for the no act variance on. Um. Is, I don't have any changes to the resolution. Does anyone else have any changes? And is who's eligible to vote on that? Um, okay. The only ones, well, the people who are not eligible are not here tonight, so everybody's eligible. Move approval of the resolution as submitted. 
Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, then we have the resolution for the Barclay property on Walnut. I don't have any changes to that resolution. Does anyone else have any changes? Move approval of the resolution as submitted. So a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And just for the record, I'm going to note that Mr. Smith is present. Okay. And, and Janet, you handed out the proposed meeting schedule for 2020. I did. Do you want us to? Suggest absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going from the least consequential to the most in terms of the meeting, the twentieth is inauguration day. But I suspect that just in case that poses an issue for anyone, the seventh Fe February seventeenth is Ash Wednesday. In case that poses an issue for anybody. And more significantly, September 15th is the start of Yom Kippur, which I suspect is a significant. We should not have a meeting on that date. So I would suggest changing September 15th to September 22nd. And does anyone have any other issues with the proposed schedule? I have a problem with October 20th, but it's a personal problem. And if I can't travel, I won't be going anywhere, so. But, but we're booked. Okay. Does someone want to move the adoption of next year's meeting schedule with a one proposed change? Move approval of the schedule with the change to the September 15th meeting, making it to September 22nd. Is there a second? A second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone? Anyone? Okay. The first application is that of Valdezada Dolgan, the property at 10 and 12 Washington Street. This is an application to construct two new two-family homes on each lot with variances as is below. The property is located in the R2 two-family zone. is designated on the township tax maps as lot 15 and lot 16 block 2010. Variances are from pre-existing non-conformities for lot area of 4,000 square feet is required, whereas Lot 15 has 3,750 square feet, and lot 16 has 3,875 square feet. Pre existing non conformities for lot width 60 feet is required, whereas lot 15 has 30 feet, and lot 16 has 31 feet. The monitor section 45D1 variance is required from the minimum front yard setback of 25 feet. The applicant proposes a front yard setback of 5.75 feet for each proposed house. Montclair Code Section 347-45C1 variance of the required minimum side yard setback of 6 feet from one side and 10 feet from the other. The applicant proposes a 5 foot side yard setback for one side yard and 6 foot side yard or it's set back for the other side yard. For Montclair Code Section 347-45D, variance of the maximum building coverage, which is 30%. The applicant is proposing building coverage of 31.6%. Section 347-101, a variance from the required number of off-street parking spaces. The applicant proposes two, three bedrooms for each lot. Of 
according to the residential site improvement standards of required number of Wall Street parking spaces for each lot is four spaces. The applicant proposes a total of two Wall Street parking spaces for each lot. Montclair Code Section 347.104, a variance of the required minimum setback of one foot for driveways and four feet for parking areas. The applicant proposes zero foot setback for the driveway. The applicant requires a waiver of the site plan standards from the following sections of Montclair Code. Montclair Code Section 281-9B, a waiver to permit parking spaces of nine feet by 18 feet. For Montclair Code Section 281-9B, a waiver of the minimum two-way driveway width of 18 feet. The applicant poses an easement for a shared driveway width of 12 feet on each proposed property. Are taxes paid? And is the notice in order? Yes, it is. Mr. Viteri, you're here on behalf of the applicant. Is that correct? You, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. How are you tonight, members of the board? Uh, are you able to hear and see me okay? Yes. yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Makrazada Dolgan Trust. Um, Ms. Dolgan is the trustee and the applicant in connection with the uh, proposals that we've submitted here at 10 and 12 Washington Street. May I ask a procedural question because I'm not sure I understand this. These are not merged lots. Normally, we only see two properties being done on a single application when it's a merged lot, which these are not. And I was just wondering whether we needed to treat this as two separate applications. Uh, we, su we submitted them as, um, you know, they, we, we noticed all of the individual uh, variances for each lot. Um, for sake of ease on this, we have, um, this I believe has been treated as one application with two property addresses. Uh, the memorandum that I received from uh, Mr. Petto references the addresses, but um, shows, I believe, one application number, application 2689. Michael, I just don't, I don't know because all the paperwork is for each of the, each property separately. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of odd. I mean, ultimately, this is, the application is to construct a two-story, a two-family dwelling on this subject property, 10 and 12 Washington Street. Uh, at, if the application is approved, we can we can have the lots consolidated so it's on one lot if that satisfies your concern. No, it doesn't. I just didn't know that we could run two applications on non-co-joined lots simultaneously under one application. That was my only concern. It's, uh, if you're saying it's fine, I have no problem with it. I, I'm just raising an issue. They're adjacent lots. Yes. But they, they, are adjoining. they are adjoining just to be clear we are we are treating these and viewing these as separate applications the the only joinder of the two would be the driveway easement that would connect the two of them but we're not seeking a merger of the lots uh, i think that would cause other issues uh so yeah, we yeah, that's the question. keep them the same okay all right so we have one application with two properties adjacent to each other okay if that's, if that's okay that's fine thank you Okay, thank you. So the the, um, the application that we have here, you know, I'll, I'll quote one of your more famous residents of the township, and it's a little bit like deja vu all over again in that it uh, in many ways mirrors the application that um, I was before the board on on behalf of Shrek Development, which is directly across the street at 11 and 13. And uh, I think we've taken all the best of that application and made it uh, made it better, as you'll see tonight when we introduce the architect and the engineer with respect to, you know, certain modifications. The the lots that you're seeing tonight are um, we have more frontage on these lots, so we're able to um, to integrate that into the plans. The 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 plan essentially is keeping in uh, the the entire setting is the same as the Shrek application. We are not seeking a use variance. It would be the two family and conforming with the use. Um, as you went through all of the various bulk variances, and we'll speak to each of them uh, later on in the evening. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce our uh, introduce our architect to give an overview of this plan in terms of the elevations, the facades, the uh, the floor plans, 
and then we'll go into speaking about the improvements that were being made to the properties by way of the site plan. And we have uh, Mr. Fantina, who was also the engineer on the application for the Shrek. So with that said, uh, I believe our architect is on, if I'm looking at the, uh, the participants, Mr. Kaplan, are you on? I don't think so. Uh, is Mr. Uh, Mr. Charlet, is he on? Uh, I think so. Joseph Charlet? Uh, Mr. Viteri is. No, that's you, I'm sorry. That's, yep, that's <laughs> me. I thought there was three people. Mr. Uh, there's David Fantina. Yeah, no, I don't have the architect here. The architects did have a, a matter, I believe, in Bernard's Township that um, was going on, although they said they were concluding at 7.30. If it pleases the board, would it be okay for us to have Mr. Fantina speak to the site plan aspects of the application? And then as soon as they're done, uh, we're texting them right now, we could lead into the um, speak about the architect, not how we plan to do it, but uh, a bit of a game change. That, that's fine. All right, Mr. Thank Mr. Fantina, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? I do. Would you state your name and address, please? My name is David Fantina, F as in Frank, A-N-T-I-N-A. -N 15 Sunset Drive, Bernardsville, New Jersey. Mr. Fantine, if you would give the board a bit of your educational and professional experience. Yes, I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey. I did appear before this board a few years back for the Shrek application that Mr. Vettery uh, indicated was similar to this one. I've been the proprietor of Fantine Engineering for 19 years. I routinely appear uh, around the state. And your license is in good standing in the state of New Jersey? It is, yes. Go accept him as an expert engineer. Thank you. And I will say that the architect is still in the meeting that I just left. We were in Manville together. I finished my testimony, but he's still on. You know, having a little feedback issue. Uh, Mr. Fantino, are you on? I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I'm able to hear you now. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not hear. Was he qualified, Mr. Sullivan? Yes, he was. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Fantina, you um, you have prepared the site plan uh, and the plan application for 10 and 12 Washington and are in receipt of the October 16th letter from Mr. Petto. Uh, I'd like you to give an overview of your plans and then address the comments and questions and concerns in the memo. Uh, certainly. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. Here, okay here I go. Uh, as was said, these are two very narrow properties located on Washington Street almost across the street from the Shrek application that was approved by this board a few years ago. Both uh, properties are undersized. They have widths of 30 and 31 feet, which is where 60 feet is uh, required in the zone. Uh, there is an existing building on the one property. However, uh, in, in the not very distant past, there was, also, there was also a house on the other property so both these properties have been developed uh, with, with, with homes. What the proposal is, is to knock down the one home, the other home is already gone. Two very nice, two family dwellings, very, very similar to the Shrek application. Bring the driveway between the buildings, four parking spaces to the rear, shared access, uh, cross easements for access, for drainage, and what have you. The variances, as I said, we are fairly simple. I mentioned that we have insufficient lot widths. In addition to that, uh, we need six and 10 foot wide setbacks. We have, we're proposing six and five. The obvious reason for that is simply because these properties are so narrow, the houses really can't get any more narrow and still be functional. The front setback uh, required is 25 feet. We are requesting seven and a half feet and one of the reasons we're doing that is to make our backyard uh, usable for parking because we believe that providing four parking spaces at this location is, is a benefit. It gets parking off the street on a road in a neighborhood where parking is at a premium. 
But in addition to that, it's in keeping with the neighborhood. The board will see that the existing house that's going to be demolished is actually significantly closer to the property, to, to the right of way line than, than our building will be. Uh, the maximum building coverage is 25%. We're proposing 30.9% uh, on each lot. And again, that's a function of the size of these lots. These are not large buildings. They're relatively modest two-family dwellings. And to make them any smaller would be would make them basically unusable. And then obviously we have a common driveway, so we do not have we the sufficient or required setback from the driveway to the property line. Uh, it's supposed to be one foot, but we're using the driveway right over the property line, so that would be zero zero feet. And the final um, the final variance that we're requesting has to do with the number of parking spaces. As I said, we're proposing four uh, because we have four units. The requirement is two per unit or eight spaces. Uh, in your uh, planner's memo. Uh, he requests that we take a look at providing those eight spaces by instead of having the four along the back, having four along each of the side property lines. And we actually would like to do that, but we don't have the room. If, if you do the math, it's a 31 foot and a 30 foot wide width. That's 61 feet. Uh, minimum acceptable uh, parking uh, uh, drive aisle between two parking spaces would be 24 feet. That's what you have at, at any location. And the parking spaces themselves have to be a minimum of 18 feet deep. So 18 plus 24 plus 18 is 60 feet. Remember, we have only 61. The curb is six inches wide in each case. So in order for us to comply with that and put four spaces on each side, we would literally be building the curb on the property line, on both property lines, to the left and to the right. And in addition to that, because we'd only have 18 foot wide deep spaces. If the cars had any overhang, which they would, they'd be overhanging into the neighboring property. So while we comply with that, we really don't have the opportunity. Uh, overall, at the risk of uh, beating a dead horse and saying the same thing four or five times, uh, I do want to say that the, the spirit of this uh, project was inspired by the project across the street. We tried to take what was that project, uh, all of the elements that the that the board had asked for at that time, uh, even to the, the extent that um, if I can share my screen here, is that possible? No, we can't share. I can't share the screen. Okay. That's fine. Me, yeah, if you go to the next sheet, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and the reason I, I wanted to go to this sheet was, was simply so that even some of the minor elements that the board had asked for across the street, such as stepping stones, so that people in the front can walk out to the front door without coming down the driveway, we've incorporated them. We, we tried to uh, look back at that application, find anything that, that the board thought was important and incorporate it into, incorporate it into this application. Yeah. We also have a, a dry well in the back. Um, all the drain into the dry well. It'll okay. also go um, above ground, uh, similar to what was done with the Shrek application. And there will be easements for responsibility of maintaining that and uh, access and maintaining the driveway. Mr. Vedder, that's all I really have, unless you wanted to ask me some more questions. Okay, thank you. I don't know if I'm, uh, can you hear me, board? Am I on mute? We can hear you. Thank you. Uh, um, I, mean, no, I don't have any further questions um, for you, but uh, I'm sure the board may have some questions for you. Um, um, I have a question. I'm not sure if I, I have a question. Can I be heard? Okay. I, I don't understand. 
I have a lot of background noise. Somebody's got a lot of background noise there. Um, the question I have is why the curb, why does the curb cut from all the way across the sidewalk? Uh, I've never heard that kind of thing. You have to cut the sidewalk to step down and step back up. And unless I'm misreading it, your curbs are running essentially from the street um, into the driveway, which means everybody has to step off a curb and then back up again on the other side of the driveway as opposed to really having a normal curb cut in the last two feet or so of the driveway for the cars to get down. I find this, I find that approach very, not very good for the pedestrians who are walking on the sidewalk. In fact, I find it to be dangerous. So I don't understand that. Uh, Mr. He's, he's muted. Yeah, Mr. Fantina, there was a lot of feedback, so I muted you. But now you can unmute. <laughs> Can't hear him, he's, he's muted. Uh, now, now you're unmuted, Mr. Fantina. Okay, so, sorry about that. So I believe, Mr. Fletcher, you're referring to the sidewalk coming across our driveway? No, I'm referring to the driveway going across the sidewalk. The driveway going across the sidewalk. It's showing curves on both sides. So you basically have to step down into your driveway and step back up again to simply walk on the side. Well, we were going to put a uh, press curb there. I don't know if it's specified. I, the I, I must say I can't hear what's being said. Can you hear me now? I can hear you if the, if the other sounds are not coming in. There's a lot of other sound. Okay, I'll be as quiet as I can. I don't think that's from me. It, I, I will say that uh, we will put depressed curb in that area so that there would be no tripping hazard. It was not not only indicate our intention to make a tripping hazard in that area, but we'll certainly specify depressed curb there. That's an excellent idea. I, I just don't want to see curbs running across the. I don't want to see the driveway forcing a pedestrian on the sidewalk to have to step down and step back up again. So there should be there should be a clear walking path on the sidewalk and merely the curb cut going from the edge of the sidewalk down to the street. Is is that clear or unclear? I'm not sure. You're unmuted. I guess that's uh, that, that's clear. We can do that. I, I would agree to that. Thank you. Joe, do you have any questions? Um, I guess, I didn't, was there a variance for a two-way drive that's only 12 foot wide? Yes. Okay, that's on the list. It's obviously, you're never gonna have two cars going down that driveway together. And, and, and maybe essentially all I'm seeing is, is the property line. Okay, that's why it looks like it's a, a divide. But that's only going to take one car, period, in that width. Agreed. Yes. That's all I basically have until we talk to the architect. Okay. I have a question, Phil. That's Angela. Um, okay. How how wide are the paths that are being provided um, to walk from the front to the back of the property? They're simply stepping stones. They would only be uh, 12 to 18 inches. There's really very little room there uh, because of the window wells. Okay, so I mean, 12 to 18 inches isn't really enough for someone to get past there with, you know, a bag or, or anything like that. I mean, is there any other way to get to the back of the property other than walking down the middle of the, the driveway? You would have to draw, walk down the middle of the driveway. If you were carrying something in your, your arms, you needed room, you'd have to go down the driveway. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, Mr. Moore, do you have any questions? Not, not at the moment. Okay. Mr. Simon, do you have any questions? Yeah, just one. Um, I don't see any any lighting uh, being provided for the unit in the back. Is there a, was there a lighting plan, uh, to, a proposed lighting plan to, to show um, how much light would be available for the person traveling to the back of the property? Uh, you know, what, what we were trying to do there was to minimize the amount of light. The only lights provided here are architectural lights on the building. Uh, that's the way it was, it was being across the street. We felt that since we're in a residential area, to place some kind of pole lights in our rear uh, parking area would be obnoxious to the neighbors. Um, so we're just proposing uh, architectural lights. But the, but that's not represented anywhere on the diagrams, so whether it's in the driveway or on the on the walkway. There's, there's nothing uh, shown. Uh, that's correct. We could add some bollard lights if the board felt that was important. I uh, wouldn't put anything higher than that because, as I said, we wouldn't want to be bad neighbors to any of the neighboring people. We could certainly add bollard lights so the trips coming um, coming home at night. That's all. Um, Mr. McCulloch, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fantina, I'm wondering about the uh, area from the proposed concrete pads uh, to the back of the parking area. So you talked about uh, being able to accommodate four parking spaces uh, instead of instead of uh, eight that ordinarily would be required. So I'm wondering, can you tell me, what am I looking at? I mean, what is in the space between those four parking spaces and the concrete pads. Uh, that area is simply uh, there's concrete pads there uh, for uh, trash recycling. But what you're seeing between the four spaces and that is the 25 foot back out aisle. So somebody pulls it in. And the ability to make the K turn and get back out the driveway frontwards. If I understood your question properly. Okay, so yeah, I think you did. Uh, you know, the question I'm, I'm having is at your design is whether or not uh, you could accommodate both parking uh, in front of those concrete pads. But you're suggesting that would not be because of the 25. Area. Would, there wouldn't be enough room, no. All right, thank you. Okay, Mr. Caulfield, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have two questions. Um, David, um, in the uh, front along the sidewalks, you have um, boxwoods going to be planted in the sidewalk. Is there any reason why we couldn't do trees? I know you had something to say about the utility lines, but I don't know what boxwoods would look like in the front there. Just, a, just a thought. Um, uh, no, oh yeah, no, go ahead, David. Sorry. Whatever, whatever you thought would be appropriate. Uh, the boxwood might have been a little bit generic. We could certainly put something more attractive than that there. Uh, there are overhead wires, so I don't think we could put a good-sized tree, uh, but maybe a burning bush or, or a couple of burning bushes, something of that nature. I'm not a, um, a landscape architect, but I could talk to somebody about that, or uh, I could talk to your professionals about that. Um, David, just one other question. Um, I looked at the property across the street, and um, the leaders in the front along the driveway, it looks like they encroached into the driveway. I don't know if you saw that at all. I did not, no. Okay. So I, 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 I don't know. I just I thought the leaders for the that house. If it's going to be a similar house, maybe it's more a similar house. But the leaders on that house had come into the driveway, which you know I thought was an after effect. But um, um, that it, it depends if you saw it. Um, no more further questions. Thank you. I, I think we can we can avoid that. I think. Uh, I believe we have them underground on this application, Mr. Fantina. 
That that is correct. I was wondering if they meant coming down, but they are underground. Coming, the other ones were coming down from the roof. Um, I didn't take a picture, but it was it was different. It was it, I thought it was not thought through. But yeah. No worries. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely look at that. Ms. Gilmer, do you have any questions? No questions at this time. Okay. Um, I, I have a number of questions about what's happening between the house and the adjoining properties on both lots. You're showing two air conditioning units, is that correct? Yes. And do you know what size those units are and how close they'll be to the property line? They're going to be standard uh, air conditioning units. We have, um, you know, three by three foot pads. It may be a little bit smaller than that. And they're about a foot and a half property line. Okay. And then showing what I, my understanding are that the window wells, you know, how close to the property line those are going to be? Um, yes. Uh, Bill, you make a, you raise a very good point. We don't permit um, those air conditioning units to be in the side yard setback. Yes, I'm, I'm concerned for that. But. Yeah. They can be moved to the rear if, um, if that's necessary. There is some room in the rear. We do have two uh, behind each of the buildings. I believe we could fit four. So we could, we could move the, the side air conditioning units to the rear. Uh, the window wells encroach to about 16 inches off the property lines. Okay, is there an ability to reduce that so we can have a wider path if we're ultimately heading with both the air moving the air conditioning units and that? I would defer to the architect on that. Okay, we, I, we will ask him. The, the other thing that I'm just looking at how we address that issue on the Shrek application, and I believe in the resolution we agreed to put them on the roof. You mean the air conditioning units? Yes. Okay. So we'd be willing to do the same here. Um, okay. Um, are there any members of the public who have questions for this witness? And this is just an opportunity to ask questions of this witness. There'll be a later opportunity if you have comments on the application. Okay. okay. No. I've unmuted the, the other so we can I've unmuted the members of the public. But I don't think anybody is here for this application. Is there anybody who has comments? Or, quest or questions? I mean, questions on this application? Pretty late. I, I want to go back on the air conditioning units. I muted them. I'd like to go back on the air conditioning units. Is there any reason why all four of them can't be on the concrete pads in the back? There, there's no reason. They, if that's the preference, they can be in the back. Well, it would also avoid having to go for a different variant. I'm very concerned if, if one looks at the architectural drawings, which we have before the application started, there's no place to put them up on the roof in the current design. Now you could throw them up top, but then you've got to start doing things that will hide them from view. So it doesn't seem to me that putting them up on the top of the building is going to work in this, in this design that's been represented. I know the architect's coming in, but if they could all be back on the pad, that would make life a lot easier. And the rest of it is just chiller pipe, you know, piping the chiller water to the units, which have to be, which I assume are inside. There must be units inside. It's not. Yeah. Um, I'm speaking with the applicant right now, and uh, she's very experienced with the HVAC, these two and a half ton units, and she's saying that all four can fit in the back and that we would agree to do that. I think it's a good recommendation. Thank you. Uh, what's your status on your other witness? So the other, the other witness is texting that they are still giving testimony elsewhere. Um, uh, Ms. Dolgan and myself are here, both familiar with the plans and are able to walk the board through the uh, the floor plans um, if that pleases the board. 
it's up to you as to how you want to proceed. Uh, that that would be fine. I just I, I think that uh, we've submitted the applications um, and we have the floor plan, so we'd like to proceed. Uh, apologies that uh, I guess they're running long um, in their uh, at the Bernard's Township meeting. And you want to call Ms. Dolgan? Um, yeah, sure. Okay. So Ms. Dolgan, would, Ms. Dolgan, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? I do. State your name and address, please. Malgorzata Dogan, 46 West Valley Brook uh, Road, Long Valley, New Jersey, 07853. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dolgan, if you would give the board an overview of the uh, of the floor plans for the homes. Um, I think we can just do it for pick one. They're the identical uh, floor plans for 10 and 12 Washington. Sure. Um, what we are well we've been with this project in front of the board a couple of times but i'm hoping that this time we got it right and uh, the board will accept the um uh, you know the proposed drawings um the, why don't you start start with the elevation so you know you, sure. you spoke very um, you know passionately about what your plan was for the elevations here and how that fits into the neighborhoods so maybe sure. give the board an overview of the elevations then we'll work our way into the floor plan. You got it. So the elevations, the front, I would like to uh, keep them uh, traditional, but yet more contemporary with white stucco finish on the front, black windows uh, on the inside and on the outside, um, black darker roof and white siding on the sides of the house. So the house, the whole house, the, each each building would have very nice, very clean look. Uh, like I said, white stucco, black windows, and with nice green shrubs and uh, trees that we can plant. It would add a lot of uh, nice visual uh, 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 like uh, uh, effect to the street. Um, each, each building would have on the first floor when we walk in would have a um, kitchen and living space area with a small powder room packed away behind the stairs. Um, so you're referring to page A2 on the plan? Yes, page A2. Okay, go ahead. Um, on the first floor, we have uh, a nice living space, uh, a dining area, kitchen, and a powder room behind the stairs. Then when we walk upstairs, we have two bedrooms, not uh, a big size, but decent size, comfortable for, you know, a family. Two bedrooms with uh, two bathrooms. And on the attic, I would like to create an office space, especially now since so many uh, people work more and more from home. Um, I would like to put an office space, comfortable office space with a bathroom. And uh, in uh, all the way down on the on, in the basement, I would like to put another bedroom, possibly a playroom uh, also with a bathroom. And that bedroom would have, uh, of course, egress uh, windows. Those and, are the egress windows we, Mr. Fantina spoke about in the setback. Yes. Um, so again, they are not big units, but comfortable, uh, comfortable living and uh, very clean look on the outside. And when you um, when you review the architectural plans with the architect and looking at um, what you've done in that neighborhood and what your neighbors have done, uh, I know it was important to you to put a style together that you think they feel complements this neighborhood without overpowering. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. I think the both projects, you know, 11 and 13 Washington Street across the street and this 10 and 12 Washington Street will echo each other and complement each other. And, nice. and the board will hear about New Street shortly. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think that's very well done. We'll see if the board has questions of you regarding the architectural plan. Okay, Mr. Fleischer, do you have any questions? Just came in last year when I was out ill. Um, but for me, 
I'm concerned about the size of these buildings. I'm actually concerned about the height of these buildings, whether they meet the requirement or not. And therefore, I'm concerned about the third floor. Um, a, a simple peaked roof would be a lot less bulky than this. It would lower the sense of height when you're going down the narrow alley. It's adjacent to other properties. My reaction is this building is bigger than it needs to be. There's no reason on a site this small to be packing so much stuff in here, including the low ground space, which makes it almost impossible to get those walking alleys, and then a third floor space in essence. To me, there's much too much building going on onto this site. And I'm not comfortable with the amount of building that's going onto the site and the massing of the building on the site. I have some real concerns about it. Um, and, and we're just creating spaces. And on top of the spaces are created, we're then creating bathrooms. And when you put bathrooms up on that top floor, you can call it a study, but there's as good a chance that it's gonna be a bedroom. Um, this, this, there's just too much here on these very narrow sites. And the slender buildings I think can be elegant. I don't think they need four floors of living to make this a decent property for people who would like a small property. But I, I do think there's too much building right now. And what it's doing is it's impacting the ground floor with all the window wells. And it's also impacting the massing of the building at the top by the need for the dormers. It, it's just creating a building that's essentially three full floors and height above the ground because those dormers, whether they meet the criteria of, of, of space or anything else, are an extension of, uh, are in essence, a, a pretty much an extension of the wall beneath them. And so the building is really feeling and appearing when you're in the alley or on the side yards as a three-story building, which I don't think should be the case on such a small site. So I have some real problems with the architectural aspects of the application as it's currently submitted. And I don't know if, if there's an explanation as to why we need all those rooms in the basement and rooms on the third floor. And it's it, it just, to me, overbuilt for what is a very, very tight site, which we all understand. And I and I I like the notion of putting back two family buildings on this site, but I think these two family buildings are much larger than they need to be. So I don't know if the applicant wants to respond or talk about it, but to me this is much too big from my perspective. So and I, and I, I appreciate the perspective, and, and we had the opportunity to speak about this when we um, were. Con, you know, doing the concepts plans here and uh, looking at. Well, I think the applicant, I think the witness ought to be testifying, not, not, not. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm, go, I'm going to get to a question to the applicant. So when, when we were conceiving this and looking at what to do, the, 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 there was a plan for combining the lots, which I, I believe we started out that way with the Shrek lots and then separate, separated them and made them smaller. So to to address the questions that and the concerns that they have, what's the approximate size of that basement? It, um, the commissioner mentioned two rooms in the basement. I, I believe there's only one room in the basement. There is only one room in the basement. So with, with regard to any reductions that could happen in that space. You have a mechanical and storage room and one room. Right. And with respect to the um, attic office, there's a bathroom up there. Is that something that um, you would be willing to reduce and eliminate the bathroom to um, the, you know, assuage the concern of the board member relative to that being a bedroom? Yes, definitely. I mean, I uh, wanted to put the, ba the bathroom there out of convenience if someone works from the office uh, out there. But uh, if, uh, you know, if that's uh, too much, we don't have to put them. Well, let, me, let me go further on this. 
the bathrooms are oversized and they're just creating mass that isn't necessary even on the front of the building. There's just too much mass here. What I would recommend and what I'd suggest is if you want to study space, put, it, put that down in the basement and call, call it whatever you want and then put a small bedroom in above. But to shove, put, to put somebody in the basement, which then requires the window wells to be a bedroom down there and then still build a third floor with this huge amount of space that you're creating, that combination is just not right. And the notion of putting someone in the basement when there's an opportunity to put them above ground is also not right. There's something wrong with the balance in this design in terms of the scale and the way it's being done. And what's being put on the third floor and what's being put in the basement are yet another problem from my perspective. People shouldn't be living in the basement when there's a third floor where they could be living. There's something wrong with it in terms of the way it's being approached for the sake of just gaining more space. And, and I don't think it's appropriate on a site that's already impacted by its very scale. So Mr. Fleischer, I just wanna understand the recommendation. So the recommendation would be to re remove the bedroom space in the lower level the what, what i'm suggesting is if you want to put a recreation room or something else down there that's fine i'm not even sure what the exit requirements are but certainly for a bedroom you're going to need an exit the stuff that's in the basement should not be habitable space other than maybe as a recreation room or a study or an office or call what you want but more importantly, I'm concerned about the amount of building that's being put on the site. And I think once you get up to the third level, though I don't agree that it should be there at all, once you get up to the third level, at least make it a small bedroom and a small bathroom of a scale that makes sense, not something that literally goes from one end of the building to the other. I just think it's, way too much for the house the pop out in the front is really i find it inappropriate especially for the wall of a it's just it's just not right there's something wrong with the design it's just not right it, there's just too much stuff there on these tiny lots and you can yeah, have a very nice two-bedroom apartment two-bedroom home on each lot without all the other stuff that's here. It's a problem for me. Maybe so, others don't have the problem. I'm expressing my own concerns. Sure, and that, that's part of the process. That's why we're here to hear the good input and um, you know try to get to a win-win that works for the applicant and, um, and also satisfy the concerns that you have. Um, is the concern for the massing or the um, is there a concern about the building coverage? Because we're it sounds to me it's really the massing. The answer is it has nothing to do with the coverage. It has to do with the amount of square footage in these units, right? And the need to create essentially a very very large third floor, where when you put in all those dormers, you've got a huge third floor, and this is not a an air, we're supposed to have a two and a half story floor, and I know you're allowed to have dormers, and I know the rules, but we're doing it on a very narrow lot, and all it's doing is making these buildings higher than they need to be, and making it more unpleasant both in the driveway in, and in the so-called walkways, which is a number of the other board members have said can't function as walkways anyway. So it's just, it's just too much mass and too much building on the site to make me feel comfortable with it. Um, I have less problems with the overall coverage. I don't have problems with, with the amount of yards. Could they be 18 foot wide buildings? Probably, there are a lot of townhouses in, in various cities um, that are 18 foot wide. They could be an 18 foot wide townhouse type building and still have windows and everything else, but you've decided to maximize it. I just think there's too much building there. Yeah, we don't have the 18 foot units usually have much more depth. So we would, um, 
we really don't have that level of depth um, in order to accommodate that. And these aren't that much wider than that. Again, I really would like to hear from the applicant, not the attorney. I, that's who I want. That's who I'm talking to, the applicant. I'm saying there's too much building there. And that's who I would like to hear a response from. So um, just to make sure I understand uh, you correctly, um, you would like to see no living space no bedroom in the basement and uh, smaller bedroom and smaller bathroom up in the attic um i guess i guess my point is if you had a bedroom there in the attic instead of what you're calling the office study you wouldn't even need the big dormers coming that far out into the space, which makes the massing as large as it is. You'd have a decent sized second bedroom along with a, a small bath to accompany it. I mean, those, those, that, what you call the study is a huge room and a huge bathroom that goes with it. And all it's doing is filling up the sky with dormers everywhere. And I just think for a house that's this narrow, to me, it does not do well for the site. It's not a, in my mind, a good solution for the site. Mr. Chairman, I, th I think we have the al the architect uh, here as attendees. I, I, under I understand that what we can do is, uh, I think it's a it's a it's a very good suggestion, and um, you know, keeping someone up in the bedroom uh, in the attic is definitely a lot better option than in the basement. I mean, who wants to sleep in the basement? I agree. If we could finish the basement and keep it as, uh, um, you know, even recreational room, or if they want to make an office in a basement, I think that's, that's, uh, that's a proper use of a space in the basement, and then create a smaller bedroom and smaller bathroom up in the attic and reduce uh, the size of the dormers and, and i also i also appealing uh, it can also allow you to eliminate a bunch of the window wells you have you yes, only need would. one window well for each for each bedroom basically you wouldn't need one on like you wouldn't even need them on both sides what uh, i would like to even do i don't know if it's possible uh put the window wells on the front of the building and maybe on the back of the building, if there's room for that. This way we would avoid... Oh yeah. And I'm suggesting a redesign would be very helpful. Right now there's too much house and too much mass on these very narrow lots. Okay. Okay. We hear it. We hear it. Yeah. We hear it. So no bedroom in the basement and smaller bedroom and uh, smaller bathroom in the attic. Yeah. I, again, I, I don't. Beautiful. Yeah, I think the whole mass of the building has to read a lot smaller than it's currently reading. And part of the reason is you've almost created a full third floor by virtue of what the plans are now. And that's not the intent of the ordinance. And that's not the intent of um, what you tr it shouldn't be the intent of what you're trying to do here. It's just too much build too much building mass on that site. Well, we we you know went by what uh, is uh, being built right now across the street and uh, what's allowed in the code. But if it's uh, you know too much, uh, we can reduce the dormer size definitely. I'm done, Bill. Okay. Um, Mr. Moore, do you have any questions? Not at the moment, still, still listening. Um, Mr. Simon, do you have any questions? Uh, um, so just based on Joe's suggestions, so you, are you saying that you agree to the farmers and also, um, uh, the, the basement windows if you're going to switch the usage of it yes we we are yes we are definitely uh willing to to 
uh, reduce the wind, the, the dormer size and uh, eliminate the window wells. If the bedroom in the basement, window wells are not uh, required. So oh, um, that might, and along with the, the relocation of the AC units, potentially really change um, what we're looking. Do we need to see dated drawings before we can approve? I guess this question is for you, um, though. If they're, if they're making these changes, can we a theme? Well, I, let, let's see where we're ending up, and then we can decide whether it makes sense for whether we can condition it and get what we want or whether we're gonna to need to see revised plans. So um, at some point, yes, we should require them to come back. I wanna see where everyone is and, you know, with in terms of what changes we want in the building design. Okay, um, uh, no other questions, thank you. Mr. McCulloch, do you have any questions? Um, just uh, one question, but also a comment, which is to say that I very much agree with what uh, Mr. Fleischer uh, was pointing out in terms of the third floor, uh, because I also uh, felt that uh, I mean, that the size of the bathroom was an invitation to have uh, uh, another bedroom up on that, on that level. I'm also concerned about the mass of these buildings in this space. It uh, really seems to be quite substantial. Uh, for such a limited space. But the question that I have relates to the um, entrance uh, to the respective buildings from the street side. And, and both of them, uh, for both buildings, um, are in very close proximity to the driveway itself. And so I'm wondering, you know, if consideration was given to moving those doorways over a bit or perhaps on the other side of the central window, uh, it just seemed as though, you know, a person could conceivably slip off those steps into the driveway or a child or whatever. It just seems like it's uh, potentially uh, a hazard. Are we looking or? Moving the entrance on the left side changes the whole dynamic of and the layout. Uh, it's uh, the entrance on the left side is going to change the flow of the apartment. The entrance on the right side allows us to have a coat closet, uh, which you know you can uh, leave uh, the, the, the you know the stuff in when you come in and go straight upstairs. I think the only solution here would be to put the railings, which we were going to do anyway for safety. So on the platform and on the steps going down. You could also just flip the coat closet so that the entrance stairs and the doors are a little bit further inside the building um, and, and further away from the driveway. Right, that would be a um, that's possible, but then we are walking straight onto the stairs, going upstairs. We really dealing with very small units. We don't have much room to play with, uh, you know, with that. Of course, it would look nicer if that door could be inside. I love that look. It's uh, like, you know, typical Chicago homes uh, where the doorway is inside the building. And I would love to do it. I just don't think we have the room here. No, I'm just I'm just saying that where you have the coat closet adjacent to the entrance, just flip it so the coat closet is on the outside wall and the door is closer to the inside of the building. Closer to the window. Closer to the window and further away from the side of the building so that the stair is away from the driveway. That's 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 definitely possible. That will not change much and we are still Kind of walking straight and we are not obstructing the flow of the living room and uh, going upstairs so yes you could also mirror image the buildings the other way and flip the entries to the outside and mirror the plans that's, that's actually right. that's an excellent suggestion yes 
That's excellent. I mean, that works as well. And especially if you don't have the bedroom down there, you can arrange the subsequent spaces in the basement so that you can still get a small well for the, for the bathroom or whatever you want to do down there and just flip it so that the stairs are on the outside and the whole plan flips. Excellent suggestion. Def yes. Yeah. Yes, for the safety reasons. Yes, definitely. Um, Ms. Harris, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, just a kind of a basic question. Other than mirroring what was done across the street, what's the reason for the side-by-side -side units as opposed to, um, you know, having one unit on top and one unit on the bathroom? I'm, I'm still troubled as I was before about having main entrances to the building in the back of the building with no real access. Um, pedestrian access to to those entrances i um i just want to make sure i understand the question correctly um so the question is why we are doing them side by side not one up on on another yes well it's a different feel and different quality of living in uh, uh a smaller space that's kind of your own that's one on top of another uh, meaning side by side units than uh, just the feel of an apartment um, because when you have a first floor and second floor it doesn't it doesn't feel like a home it feels more like an apartment uh, to elevate the quality of living being able to build side by side units is uh, I think a lot more desirable. But you essentially have four floors. So theoretically, the first floor could take the first floor in the basement and the second floor could have, you know, two levels as well on the second and the, and the third floor and, you know, still feel like a bigger apartment. It's just it, it seems like the apartments are in, in the back are kind of second class citizens and there's just no real you know now they're going to have four ac units at, at their front door um and it's going to seem like they you know uh, the, they're entering the back of the house to get into their unit not not necessarily uh the way it will be landscaped and designed and ac units um i can't leave them just exposed i would put either nice fence around them or nice plants around them um still side by side unit feels more like a home where even if we have first and floor uh, uh combined together and one on top of another it still feels like an apartment it doesn't feel like home from my experience, I uh, have a couple rental properties in the neighborhood. Um, that's what everybody wants. They, you know, they can't, they don't want to hear the neighbors upstairs. They don't want to hear the neighbors downstairs. And uh, you can't completely eliminate the sound of neighbors on top of you, no matter how much soundproofing, you know, I put there. And I do. Uh, so, this is definitely more preferable way to rent and live side by side than uh, one on top of another. Okay, thank you. Hey, Mr. Caulfield, do you have any questions? Uh, no, not at this time. Ms. Gilmore, do you have any questions? Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I just needed some clarification around um, the current lot. Um, so the current lot, is it 61 feet currently? Or are these two lots? Two lots are 61 feet combined. Each lot, 10 Washington Street is 31 feet wide and 12 Washington Street is 30 feet wide. Okay. Okay. Um, so the variance 
is for each separately or together? Pre existing condition. It, it's to, to treat the it's to treat it as one application granting variances for each unit on each lot. Okay. Okay, great. Um also uh about the parking I see that uh it's a fifty percent uh reduction. Uh, have you considered any other options to even get maybe like one or two other spaces or um, anything that could be done to provide more uh, parking? Yes, that's what David uh, Fantina uh, spoke about earlier uh, when he opened the application. David, are you with us? Oh. Hey, David, I am muted him. I'm not. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think the question would be best answered by you. Uh, I had a question regarding increasing the number of parking spaces. Regarding the parking, I'm just wondering um, what other options you may have considered to provide a, a bit more parking because this would be a 50% reduction in parking. Um, so I just wanted to know if you considered any, what, what went into that decision basically? Well, a couple of things. One is that uh, there's no off street parking on the property now. So we felt that uh, this was a benefit by providing for. There's also, you're close to the train station there. So we felt there would be um, pedestrian uh, commuter traffic uh, also, our our option because of the small size of the lot to provide additional parking is limited. Uh, I believe I mentioned that your planner, uh, Mr. Pedro, had, had asked us to provide eight. We can't provide eight. We, we might be able to provide five if we went to the side. I'm not sure if that's better than four because it's not really symmetrical anymore. Uh, but all those considerations will, will be taken into account. Okay, and uh, I think someone touched on lighting, um, lighting for the back. Uh, would that be city lighting or how would the lighting for parking go and in the back area? No, ordinarily, if this was a, a large apartment complex, we would put pole lights there at our expense and light them, and that's routinely done. In this case, because it's such a small development and because we're in people's backyards, we didn't want to put any pole lights in, but in hearing the concerns of the board, uh, I believe we'd be happy to put in bollard type lights, so low lighting, 24, 30 inches high, enough so that somebody's not going to trip after they uh, come home at night and they can get around to the front of the building, and that wouldn't be obnoxious to the neighbors. Okay, great. Okay, I, I just, and David, you should probably stay because this is I want to understand from you and Ms. Dolgan as to where where we ended up with the side yards on each lot. Are we eliminating are we both moving the air conditioning units and eliminating the the um, window wells? Well, we are certainly uh, moving the air conditioning units to the rear of the all, all of them will be on, on the rear concrete patios. As far as, the, as far as the window wells, I heard Ms. Dolgan's um, testimony, but I'm not sure if they're being illuminated or made smaller. I defer to her on that. Ms. Dolgan, you still there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, because we will eliminate the bedroom in uh, the basement, the building codes changes and there is no more requirement for window wells. So therefore we can eliminate the window wells on the side of the building. Okay, so then my, my next question, which is really uh, for the engineer is what, what, what would you then be putting in for the walkway along the side of the building so people don't have to go in the driveway to get, get either to the parking or to the resource units? Well, at that point, our options are almost unlimited that we have a minimum five foot um, setback. So we could put a concrete sidewalk 
We could put something more decorative, like a gravel sidewalk. Uh, we could look at our options, but certainly we'd have the uh, required width that um, would be the same as a sidewalk. It could be 36 inches or even wider. Okay, I, I want to know, yes, I know you have now have adequate space, but I want to know what you're proposing and then, you know, how far are you <laughs> the property line? I think uh, I'd have to talk to the applicant, but I, I think what I would propose would be something three feet wide, a foot off the building, a foot off the property line. And the, the surface of that, I would probably opt for gravel simply because I think it's a, a less formal look, uh, but we, we could go to concrete. I would just concrete. Who the hell wants to weed that? I know. I can hear you. But it's okay. <laughs> what would be your preference? <laughs> This is my aversion to weed. <laughs> but they, purely, purely at the choice of the, we thought we were muted, but if she likes to weed, Mr. Fantina, that's up to Michelle. I don't want to spray it with Roundup, no. <laughs> so you say you want concrete? That would be the, um, the most favorable option at this point, yes. Okay. Um, hey, Janice, I mean, is there any way you can selectively unmute the public so we, the subsequent applicants are not unmuted so we at least eliminate some of the noise? Um, I think, right. okay, there's only two, I think there's, yes, I can. Okay. Are, are there any members of the public who have questions for this witness about the application? And this is just a chance to ask questions of this witness. Yeah, Mr. I don't, I don't know. I don't think they have any questions. Okay. Um, the, um, Mr. Vettiri, is the architect now available? And if so, do you want to call him? I think that uh, Ms. Dolgan has done a wonderful job of explaining this, and she knows these buildings like the back of her hand. So uh, unless the board would like to hear from the architect, uh, my answer to that would be no. Okay, that's up to you. Um, okay, Janice, we're going to try again. Are there any members of the public who either have questions, testimony, comments, anything? This is your last chance to comment or ask questions about the application, otherwise we're going to, to make a decision on it. Okay, Candy, if you're unmuted. Does anybody have comments or questions? This is your last chance. Okay. Mr. Viteri, do you have anything you want to add before we decide how we're proceeding with the application? Uh, we don't have anything more to add. I think that uh, Ms. Dolgan did a perfect job of um, uh, reviewing this and I think has shown incredible cooperation, much more than most of my clients in terms of uh, a willingness to cooperate with the board. And there were a lot of good suggestions that came out of the, uh, the meeting tonight that she's willing to agree to, to make this a better project. And she is anxious to, uh, anxious to proceed here after a year. Oh. It's okay. Um, we're going to start discussion with Mr. Fleischer. And I think, Joe, the, the main question is, do we want to, how do we want to deal with this? Do we feel comfortable putting conditions on or do we want to see a redesign and have them come back? The total redesign, the, the architects should listen to a tape particularly with regard to the discussion of the overall massing and the appearance of the massing as it currently is, because I think that would be much, much too difficult to try to put into the conditions. As much as I'd like to be done with it, for everybody's sake, <laughs> uh, and, and to allow this applicant to go forward, I think they have to really study the flipping of the floor plans, the mirroring of the floor plans, the relocation of the air conditioning units. I think there's a lot of work to be done. The, in, the getting rid of the window wells, and confirming that they can get rid of all the window wells. I think there's a lot of work to be done before they can come. 
back. I'd rather bring them back and have a set of plans that we can actually work with than, than try to put conditions on it of the kind that we discussed. And I guess the question is, there are, I think I'll say with some hesitation, a couple of variances that we could grant tonight, or Mr. Sullivan would be better just told off. I, the, the question is, do we want to give the applicant an indication that on the variances related to the driveway, the building coverage, the front yard setback, I think would be this and the side yard setbacks that we're okay on those, or do we just wanna say, come back and we'll see you in a month? I think you're better off looking at the whole redesign and reviewing the entire application at that time, review the variances and grant where you think it's appropriate. Okay. Um, does anyone on the board have different thoughts about whether we should, um, have them come back with a new design. No. Okay. So, um, I don't have a meeting schedule in front of me. Um, it's the third, third Wednesday in December. Yeah, December sixteenth. So we will continue this matter until December 16th. There'll be no further notice. And and Mr. Viteri, you'll grant the board an extension of time to act until that December 16 date? Uh, yes, it will, Mr. Sullivan. And thank you for making note that it will be continued without further notice. Okay. And we'll see you in two seconds. Street. This is an app. Um, the property is located in the R2 two family zone district. The property is designated on the township tax maps as lot 72 and block 3111. Applicant is requesting variances for the pre existing non conformity. 60 feet is required, whereas 25 feet is existing for the pre existing non conformity. And for the maximum width of the proposed structure, the month of section 47-45B1, variance of the required minimum front yard setback of 25 feet. The applicant proposes a front yard setback of 8 feet to the house and 3.75 feet to the front porch. From our code section 347-45C1, variance of the required minimum side yard setback of 6 feet from one side and 10 feet from the other. Other, the applicant proposes 8.5 foot side yard setback for one side and 0.2 feet on the other side. For Montclair Code Section 347-45E, a variance from the maximum building coverage, which is 30%. The applicant proposes building coverage of 39.0%. For Montclair Code Section 347-101, a variance of the required number of Wall Street parking spaces. The applicant proposes two tandem parking spaces where four are required. The Montclair Code 347-104, variance of the required minimum setback of one foot for driveways and four feet for parking areas. The applicant is proposing a zero foot setback for the driveway. Um, are taxes paid and is the notice in order? Yes, it is. Mr. Viteri, you wanna enter your appearance? Yeah, enter my appearance on uh, this matter for Magrazada Dolgan, John Devettery Jr., Esquire, 70 East Main Street, Little Falls, um, for the applicant on this matter. Want to call your first witness? 
Yeah, I mean, this is um, this is a uh, 1876, I believe, home that uh, is planning to to stay to be renovated, and uh, I'm going to uh, call our first witness, who you will know and love as Malgrazada Zolga. Would you, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? Yes, I do. State your name and address, please. Malgorzata Dogan, 46 West Valley Brook Road, Long Valley, New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Dogan, uh, you did such a great job on the last application. I'd, I'd just like you to give an overview of what your plan is for the street, uh, for the property at Green Street. Uh, 183 New Street right now is uh, an existing two-family house that was built in 1860, 1850, something like that. Uh, so it's uh, in need of uh, some good renovation, and uh, that's uh, that's what I can do. <laughs> so this one is located right um, at the end of Washington Street. And I would like this project to also reflect the rest of the work uh, we are doing on Washington Street and in the, in the, in the area. Um, so once again, this is existing two family house uh, that has no driveway, no parking. I would like to, the, there is a road opening, but there is no driveway. Um, so that, there's curb opening but no driveway. So what I would like to do again, um, make this house stand out. Uh, it's going to be small, but uh, very comfortable, very nice living. Once again, white stuck on the outside, uh, nice black windows, uh, nice entrance. Uh, and this house would have apartments one on top of another. I can't the depth of the lot doesn't allow me to build one side by side it will be first floor with the basement will be one apartment and the other apartment will be second floor in the attic and that's how it is set up right now what i would like to do on the left hand side make the building actually more narrow so instead of expanding it i would like to make it Cut it in by almost two feet to create enough space for eight foot driveway. Once I create the driveway, I will be able to create two parking spots on the back of the property. So the entrance on this one is away from the driveway, the entrance to the, to the apartment. Uh, is on the right hand side of the building the driveway would be on the left hand side of the building and two entrances for the first and second floor units would be side by side so two front doors and when we walk into the first unit the first floor has a tiny living room and a kitchen um it has a bedroom, small bedroom on the back, and a little bedroom, bigger bedroom behind that. Um, that small bedroom uh, on the first floor is actually more the size of an office than a bedroom. However, it's still a legal bedroom. That's why I would like to create um, more living space in a basement. I would like to uh, put an addition uh, to the existing structure. The addition would be, um, let me just read the plans here, eight feet. Oh. Right, eight feet addition to the existing structure. Right now there is a porch uh, uh, added to the structure, covered porch with the footing. Uh, I would like to eliminate that porch and build the addition three and a half feet away from uh, the left side of the property line. When you look from the front of the building, it's the right side of the uh, right property line. So uh, once again, to make it clear, when you are facing the building, 
the addition would be back in three and a half feet to give me that workable space and eight feet extended past the existing house. Um, when you are facing the house on the left side, there is a driveway and that's where I am making the whole building more narrow, uh, conforming with the six foot setback um, and making the driveway eight feet wide. I, I just don't want to be all over the place and I want to make sure the no, board that's, understands that's uh, right. what I'm trying to say. Um, so that's for the outside of the building. Again, on the inside, we have two bedrooms, uh, livable, livable, livable space in a basement with a bedroom in a basement, only because uh, the apartments are just so small. I mean, the whole first floor is only 14 by uh, 45 uh, long. And the second floor will have similar layout, uh, kitchen, uh, living, small living room on the first floor, two bedrooms, and uh, office uh, rec room on the attic. And Ms. Logan, the number of spaces that you're creating by cantilevering the top? Two parking spaces. Two, th those... There is no parking space right now at all over there. Okay, and those are tandem spaces? Uh, could be tandem or could be, um, you know, on the angle. And that... But tandem spaces are probably more, more preferable there. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have no further questions of Ms. Dolgan. Hey, Mr. Fleischer, do you have any questions? Um, it's a little bit like the last one. I think there's too much going on here. Um, and I think the mass of the building is, again, much larger than needs to be because this attic plan is huge. Um, and so they've got a huge office up there and a huge recreation area, and all it's doing is making the entire scale of the, of the building just too big. And there's a lot of gymnastics going on with, with the bump outs and everything else. I just think it's both too busy and too dense. I just think the upper floor is, is, is the attic. I'll call it the attic floor, but it looks like a whole third floor to me. It's virtually as big as the floor below it in many ways. I just think it's too big. Um, I presume that strange stairway I'm seeing in the attic is simply because you clear the headroom before you make the turn. Um, and I assume that works, but I'm not certain it works. But that's somebody else's problem. I, I, again, you have an office up there and you've got the tiny bedroom on the uh, second floor. It seems to me if you want to really do this, put a decent sized bedroom on the second floor with a bathroom and then use that encapsulated small bedroom as a study or an office. That's up to the applicant. But I think, again, the massing on the top floor is, is way too large, particularly, again, as I said, on the, re uh, the first application, especially that dormant near the front. is just, from my perspective, over the top and just complicates the whole look of the building on a very small site. With regard to the basement, and I think it's okay to have a bedroom down there. It is a smaller building. I just think the sizing is is a little strange uh, when you end up with essentially. I mean, it shouldn't be a three, what is essentially a three bedroom apartment and putting someone in the basement. I just find that on a project of this scale, somewhat inappropriate. So I have the same type of comments I had on the earlier application. The earlier application, we each had the benefit of the, the two side-by-side -side lots. You got some breathing room, at least on the driveway side. But uh, again, I think there's too much being done on this side. I have no problem with the extension out the rear to create some additional space on the first and second floor, but when you carry that up to the third floor as well, I just think it's 
it's just too much too much building going on the site so i don't know if if the applicant or the architects want to respond or just having heard the comments want to say anything about it i just think there's too much building on the site particularly as it gets up to that attic floor well um yeah I, I would like to say something once again we were um uh going by what was approved on you know 11 and 13 washington street with the dormers and the roof line going straight up i actually thought that this building looks less uh like a three-story building and more like a two and a half story building um but <laughs> I need dormers to uh, have a headroom to clear for the stairs, but they don't have to be, uh, uh, well, especially the dormer on the front. I can make it smaller. I mean, the requirement for the dormer on the front is, the zoning requirement is 50% of the, uh, the front facade of the building or of the site or wherever the dormer is. We are definitely meeting that requirement but if visually it pleases the board to make it smaller i can make it smaller i i guess i guess my question is is it needed at all for the light yes and also for the building i mean just having this one big roof on the front of the building without any architectural detail on it it's, it's just, you know, it's blah, it's boring. Dormers add charm and detail that adds value and adds more, uh, it, it unifies, it unifies the purpose, unifies the buildings. Just one flat roof, the roof, but it doesn't have any charm, doesn't have the detail, doesn't have, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, I understand the dormer concept. What concerns me is what you've done is you've created a third floor by having the flat top on it, where generally we're seeing the dormers against a simple pitched roof design. And what's happening is you're right, the mass without the dormer is bad, but the mass is created by your decision to have the flat top on the roof, which is what's raising the building height and the sense of mass to the level it is. It doesn't have this, with a pitched roof, you normally get the sense of it being an attic. When I look at this roof and the flat top, it ends up looking to me like a floor. And you can define the 50% any way you want, but frankly, given, the shape of that roof, when it actually gets up to the top, the dorm is as wide as the top portion of the, the flat portion of the building. So it's really as wide as the, to me, it, it, looks, to me it looks ungainly is, is the best way I would put it. And I think it makes the mass look much larger than it should on such a narrow property. So, I don't, I'd rather see a side dormer than that and a much simpler front than this kind of quasi mansard roof that's been created. How I think the mansard is trying to get more mass and high space on the top floor. And I think it's making the building look much more massive than it should. How about more of a hip roof versus flat roof uh, dormer? It, it's the mass of that third floor. You you've got a you've got a roof line that's that's a full third floor in height, and and then you flatten it off so it's not. If if you continue it as a as a standard kind of pitched roof, you'd go way above the height limits. So what you've done is you've sort of flattened it, and what that does is it further it further in, impacts when you put the dormers on because it just makes it look like it's all one big floor. I, I can't explain it any better than that. If we were sitting in the same room, I I probably could, but I can't over the screen. But 
I, I think I'm it looks really, too massive. I'm really good, Mr. Fletcher, because I know from your experience, I can definitely learn a lot. And I mean it in, you know, very, very good way. Uh, the reason why I did the roof this way is because I thought that's what, you know, the board liked uh, by approving the projects on 11 and 13 Washington Street. Uh, again, that's I don't, why, that's don't what recall. I went, that's what I said. That's that's why I suggested this kind of roof for my architect because, like I said, I thought the board liked that look because you know the other projects right there on the same street were approved uh, the same way. I understand. I, I understand. I'm just indicating my sense now that it just looks awfully. It looks like a three-story building with a, with a chopped-off peak. I understand. But do you feel the same way about the projects on 11 and 13 Washington Street, that they are like that? You know, I don't, I, I, I honestly don't recall. I'm not okay. sure. I, I, I might have sat on that. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't recall. But in any case, I'm looking at what's in front of me. And, it, and it's, I have some concern with it. Uh, others may not feel the same way at all, and that would be fine. Um, I'm just expressing my concern, and I think it's got too many rooms in the house, and I think that's part of the reason. Uh, that second floor, that second floor unit could very well be a very nice two-bedroom unit, but instead we're creating this whole space on the third floor. So I understand. I, I agree, and we can definitely go with uh, the bedroom on the attic, and that little tiny space called a bedroom, uh, make it a nice office with nice open front door where the light comes in and uh, people can work from that space. I mean, so many uh, of, you know, my friends, my family, everybody works from home now. Everybody needs that, that little space. So we We're I, all I, I would definitely yeah. prefer to keep this in an office and put the bedroom up in the attic. I'm just looking to reduce the scale of the third floor footprint. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done, Bill. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Moore, do you have any questions? I forgot to unmute myself. Um, you know what? Uh, um, Vice Chair Fleischer pretty much echoed everything that I was thinking. So pretty much on board with um, his same sentiments. And Mr. Simon. Um, in regards to the, the tandem parking, that's, that's just driveway, just on the side? The parking is on the left side, yes. That's right. Uh, it's okay. on a pitch uh, eight one. Yeah, I, I see it on uh, No, no other, no other questions. Mr. McCulloch. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my, my feelings uh, really reflect uh, what Mr. Fleischer and Mr. Moore have said, uh, but I do have a different kind of question, and that is, uh, you know, looking at this through the lens of the planning considerations, you know, this property identifies as a two-family home, but the structure originally was, or at least as far as the tax records are concerned, was a, a one-family home. So I'm wondering, I mean, was consideration ever given to to making this a single-family home um, rather than um, a two-family home? Because it really is a, once again, it's a narrow lot, not a lot of space on either side. Uh, and um, to me, sort of uh, contributes to increasing congestion. Uh, in this neighborhood. So can you speak to that, please? It's, um, well, it's been a two-family home for decades at this point. Um, and the congestion, we're actually reducing the congestion by creating a driveway and parking spaces on the property. Well, I mean, I, I guess the congestion I'm speaking about is, is that, uh, you know, so many uh, uh, multifamily dwellings uh, are popping up now, and, and so it is increasing the density uh, of uh, 
you know, the numbers of people that are in, in the neighborhood, the number of vehicles. It just seems as though it, it you know, detracts from um, a, a more um, laid back neighborhood feel uh, to something which uh, comes across as being perhaps more urban than, than we might be really surveying for. Well, it's uh, it's a two family zone. All that neighborhood is a two family zone, so all the houses are two families. Um, oh, it's it's a conforming two family use. Yeah. All right. I mean, that's. I, I think I just want to be on record in raising that question, Mr. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Harris, do you have any questions? Um. The, I just wanted to confirm. So the width of the proposed driveway is eight and a half feet. Correct. Okay. It's. I mean, that's a little narrow for a driveway. I, I'm. I just worry that you're going through a lot of gymnastics here to, to get a driveway that's not going to be useful to anyone. Have you? Usually, it's it's typically nine feet, which is on the small side, or the narrow side. Um, have you given any thought to that? Yes, I, did. I spoke to a site planner and uh, they said that eight and a half feet is a doable, it's narrow, but it's a doable driveway. Uh, some of the parking spaces are only eight feet wide. This is eight and a half feet driveway, so a car can definitely get through. And in uh, the neighborhood where parking is a luxury, um creating two additional parking spaces to me it's uh exercise worth of uh doing with the you know with building and changes because parking is definitely uh a commodity in the and and what do your other um tenants do uh when there's no parking on site where do they park here well, on the street in the neighborhood because uh, most, uh, most uh, uh, tenants on the street cannot park overnight because uh, there is no, park, no overnight parking. Uh, Mission Street is congested to the point where the township doesn't even issue parking permits on Mission Street on the street. Uh, Elm Street is a busy road. There is no parking on the overnight over there. Elmwood, which is right next to it, uh, you can only put on Elmwood if you live in Elmwood uh, because there's no parking for no residents from 2 to 6 in the morning. Maple Avenue has only parking on one street, uh, one side of the street. There is no overnight parking on by the park. And again, restrictions to residents only between 2 and 6. Bloomfield Avenue, which is right next to it, is the same story. You can't park over there. So. Yeah, no, parking is a big issue. That's why I uh, think even though it's an eight and a half foot driveway, it's not that someone is going to be going there and speeding 60 miles per hour. They will be driving in five miles an hour to, to park the car and be able to park the car by the house, by the apartment. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, 23 New Street is only 0.4 miles away, walking distance from Bay Street train station, and 0.2 miles away from uh, bus stop uh, on uh, Bloomfield Avenue, both of which you can commute to uh, New York or, 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 you know, it's more a commuter's uh, community. So 0.4 miles, I walked it myself, is only not even five minutes walk. Okay, um, Mr. Church, I see you've joined us. Do you have any questions? You're unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, Bill, no questions at this time. Okay, Mr. Caulfield, do you have any questions? Uh, no, thank you. No, not at this time. Ms. Gilmer, do you have any questions? Not at this time. Okay. Um, I don't really have questions. So I'm going to reiterate what some of what's been said. I mean, 
Uh, I'm not going to go into whether what's there now is lawfully a one family or a two family, but my my difficulty, I'll do it in this lot is half the size of the two lots we were dealing with on Washington Street. It's 25 feet versus 30 or 31 feet in width. It's just the, the sense I have, I mean, this is a very dense neighborhood and, you know, we've dealt with a number of applications, both from this applicant and others, which I think have been improving the area and improving the existing buildings, some of which were not in the best shape. But I just have this feeling that what's happening on this slide is just creating much more than should occur on a lot of this size. And it is creating um, a feeling of density beyond what's allowed. I mean, if, you know, since it's a two family zone, we can hardly object to it being a two family, but, you know, we have a variety of variances. I appreciate, you know, the applicant doing what she can to accommodate, uh, you know, there are some towns that allow even eight foot wide parking spaces, but it's a big difference when one side of the parking space is another car, which will be a little bit away uh, from the line, hopefully, but, and having a building on one side where, you know, I suspect passengers on the passenger side are gonna have to get out before the cars park, standard size car or an SUV. But I, I just, I, I, you know, I don't have specific questions because it's, it's just, a, a, the same sense that Mr. Fleischer and Mr. McCullough expressed, so if there's putting too much on a on a very tiny lot, even for this neighborhood, um, most of the other, even the other lots on New Street are larger than this lot. And I just, it's it's just, you know, too much and not, not quite sure how best to proceed um, given that, but, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Vettiri, do you have other witnesses? No, uh, we do not, Mr. Chairman. No, I just wanted to add one comment. If you look at the uh, report that was issued by the planning office, there's a photo of the subject property in June 2019, and you can see the scale of that house, which works to the street versus what's being proposed. So it just reinforces what you right. can say I, I, you know when i you know after i looked at the two houses on washington i mean there this is yeah. right in front of you and it's a it is a very appropriate scale for this size lot um and you see it if you drive down washington street and it fits in the lot being proposed really doesn't um, okay uh, okay so are, are there any members of the public who either have comments questions anything whatsoever they want to say or ask about the application this is your one and only chance to speak about the application i've unmuted miss peretti if you want to speak mm. um it's not about this i'm, I'm not viewing this applicant okay thank you okay. Anyone else from the public who wishes to comment or ask questions about this application? I think they're all here for the other application. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Vittieri, do you want to sum up or have anything else further you want to say? So I, I think what um, we're going to do is take in the um, the changes that have been recommended here in terms of the massing of this structure, and since we're going to be returning for the other application, um, come back with this application with the revisions based on some of the feedback we received this evening. Okay, so the application of Algorzado Dolgan for 23 New Street is being continued to our no further notice of the application. So if you're here for this application, make a note and we'll see you on December 16th. Uh, if we need an extension of time, do you grant us the extension? Yes, I do. Okay. And there'll be no further notice, correct, Mr. Chairman? 
Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Thank you. See you in December. We'll see you December 16th. The next application is that of Chris and Sharon Severance, owners of property at 863 Warren Place. This is an application to reconstruct a garage at its current location. Property is designated on the township tax maps as block 1209 by 10. And the property is in the R1 single family zone. The applicants have applied for a variance from Montclair Code section 347-46A to, to permit an accessory building to be set back less than six feet from the rear and side property lines, whereas more than the Bill, you're yeah. having real problems with your, vote, with your voice, with your speaker. Your, your microphone is very, is, is Something's low. Something's right with your microphone. I don't know what to do. I don't have much more to say. <laughs> yes, the notice is, is in order. Mr. Severance, uh -huh. are you present? Uh, let me unmute him. Mr. Severance, you're unmuted. Yes, I am. Okay, Mr. Severance, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? I do. Please state your name and address. Chris Severance, 63 Warren Place, Montclair. Okay, why don't you describe to the board what you're seeking? Sure. So, uh, just a clarification. The garage has already been constructed. Um, so, as, as background, uh, in early March, our garage started to collapse. Um, one day I walked in and the beam on the west side of the garage at the top of the wall um, at the roof line had split and had caused the window on that side of the building to implode into the garage. Um, I reached out to my well, at first I did my best to try and prop it up with what limited materials I had. Um, and then I reached out to my contractor to uh, come over and take a look. And he said we might be able to uh, just get in there and, and replace a few of the studs and, and shore up the beam um, and, and take care of it that way. Uh, took a little while for him to get back. Over the next week, you know, clearly now in the midst of all of COVID, the main structural beam across the center of the garage split and collapsed, and the whole roof started. And obviously, that had progressed into something that was something that was probably fixable to um, kind of a wholesale problem and a huge health and safety risk. Um, for my you know, family and pets and our cars and what have you. Um, I called back our contractor. Um, he came out and we opened up and took down some of the uh, sheetrock that was inside of the garage and noticed that it was, it was a very large scale problem um, in that uh, there is just a tremendous amount of water damage that had accumulated in the garage over the years and a lot of rot. Um, and it wasn't long before the entire garage was going to collapse. Um, obviously, it was a fairly stressful time. Um, he said to me, you're going to need a permit. You're probably going to have to replace the whole garage. I'm not going to know better until I get in and do a lot of forensic work. Um, but you should, uh, you should reach out to the township, which I did. Um, it was obviously mid late March. Um, I think at that point, everything had been shut down and Governor Murphy had um, shut down the state um, at that point, but I called the township, I called the building um, office. Um, it rang 30 plus times. I hung up, I called back the next day, same thing, rang 30 plus times. The third day, I drove over to the office on Claremont. Um, the office was clearly closed. Uh, there was a number posted there. I tried again, uh, 30 plus times of ringing, no voicemail. Um, and I called back my contractor and I said, what do I do? And he's like, you can keep trying. And I said, I can keep trying, but I have a garage that's collapsing. 
Um, I'm fearful, fearful to go in there and get the car out. Um, I've got two boys, I've got two dogs and I, I can't have this happening and a lot of stress. Um, my wife was pretty stressed about it. Um, everybody was trying to figure out what was going on. And I said, they're shut down. I don't know what's going on. Basically tear it down, help me get the stuff out and let's rebuild it as fast as you can, but don't close it up. Um, I'll get the permit afterwards. You know, I, I want to build the code. I want a beautiful garage, um, but I don't want the health and safety risk. And I don't know what's going to happen. And we've obviously we're faced with inclement weather. So we pushed ahead and kind of start to finish, uh, took the garage down and built a new garage in about 10 days. Um, we're very happy with it. We did. I made sure he left all of the uh, inside open. And I think um, Janice, I sent you a picture that shows the inside. Didn't want to close up the walls and put up sheetrock and shelves uh, because I knew clearly we were going to have to uh, have an inspector come out and, and check on uh, the construction in there. So um, that is where we were and that's kind of how it progressed and how we got to where we were. Um, I filed the permit um, and then was asked by the building department to go get prior letters of approval from nine different constituents regarding the demolition, uh, which I did. And, and then I heard back um, from Richard in the zoning office that uh, we needed a variance, which uh, I was unaware of and didn't know that uh, we were going to need that clearly. But what we did is we built the garage exactly on top of the existing footprint of the foundation. Um, with one exception, which you probably can see in the plans there, we did not, um, there was a shed that had probably been added years ago. Um, instead of building out closer to the house on the spot where the shed, kind of on the side of the garage had been built out, uh, we just, we cut that off and just built flush. So uh, it's, it's squarely on top of the existing foundation. I think the only modifications we made uh, to the garage that were different from the previous garage is we did add some cinder block um, around the, the uh, top of the foundation to elevate the wood, which had been flush with the earth and was a contributor to some of the water damage. Um, so we raised that up one cinder block so as to uh, keep the wood away from the earth. Um, and then we also added gutters, which hadn't existed on the prior garage, which Again, I think had a, a lot to do with some issues that we had uh, when it started to collapse. <coughs> Mr. Severance, as a result of the reconfiguration of the garage, you require two variances. As I understand it, you need a side yard setback variance. The minimum requirement is six feet, and the garage that was reconstructed provides for 3.05 feet along the westerly side of the property. Uh, in addition, there's a second variance for a rear yard setback. Uh, the reconfigured garage has a setback of 4.56 feet from the northern property line, where a minimum of six feet is required by ordinance. Uh, yeah, that, that's my understanding as well. Um, I, I filed the package um, the next day after talking to Richard in the zoning office. Um, and, and, you know, for the committee's benefit, um, or the board's benefit, excuse me. Um, you know, I was in constant contact with the two primary neighbors who were, who could be, I guess, um, considered impacted by this, um, lot 11, and then, uh, I guess lot three, um, on the north side of the lot. Um, and they were aware of the process from the beginning through the end. Um, and also. Um, have been in touch with them uh, as I've been working through the permit process. I was required to send them certified letters uh, when I turned it. Uh, sorry, when I had to um, get the prior approval um, letters from the neighbors as well as the utilities, um, and and they are aware obviously of uh, today's hearing. Okay, Mr. Fleischer, do you have any questions? Yeah, I do. Um, is there a fence next to the garage? 
Uh, yes, there's a fence actually on both sides uh, of, for the variances. Um, the fence on the west side uh, between our lot and lot 11, it's a chain link fence that's about three feet high. Um, and then on our, our neighbor's property is a, as you can see there, um, a forest of, um, I forget the name of the, it's that super invasive uh, bamboo. Sorry. Um, they've got a fairly thick forest of invasive bamboo, which we've done the best that we can do to keep it from migrating onto our property, but it, it's a pretty large wall. And then behind the garage, um, there's also call it a, you know, three and a half, four foot high chain link fence. And I apologize. None of my pictures I sent you, Janice shows that, um, we're one corner um, of that building is five and a half feet from that chain link fence and the other corner is five feet. The reason I'm asking is when I look at the survey that was submitted, um, it hardly looks like there's a three foot yard and then the other one is only four and a half foot. Something's not right. Either we're just improperly drawn or something. Something doesn't look right there. Yeah, and I know. I apologize for that. I've called Ms. Mr. Helb, I guess, did this survey for us when we bought the house back in 2001. Um, I've called him multiple times and left multiple voicemails to find out if he had an electronic copy that I could provide. I did find a, this is a blown up version. I think that you have all, you all have. I did find a smaller version, which was a little clearer that I was able to uh, magnify and send to Janice, which I think she used in order to calculate these numbers. I, I uh, guess, but I guess, it, I guess it, what it, I'm it, saying is that I'm not, I guess based on the survey as shown, I'm not believing the numbers. And I don't know whether this building has been surveyed relative to your property line. That's my biggest concern right now. Because well, if, if I'm looking at it right, then the side yard is a lot closer, a whole lot closer, not, not 18 inches closer, but the, the rear yard looks like it's more than double what the side yard is showing. And I'm concerned, since this is an old survey, I'm concerned about the actual relative location of the house to the property line. And, and Janice, I don't know how to deal with that but I think the visuals don't, aren't consistent with the numbers that are in the planning report. That's the first thing. The other question is a simple one, which is nowhere does it indicate how high this garage is um, on any of the documents. So I don't know how high it is relative to the ordinance. Mr. Fletcher, it's, it's 14 foot, um, three and a half inches. To the peak. To the peak. Okay, thank you. That always. No worries. I feel, yeah. I feel better about that. I feel yeah. less good about the issue of where the fence may be versus where the property line is versus where the house is based on this document. So beyond that, I don't have any other questions. Okay. And then I don't know if Janice um, Allen is also online. My, my, my attorney, Mr. Trembulak, is also on. If, um, I, wasn't sure if you knew that. I did not know Mr. Trembulak was representing you, but Alan, you're present. Yeah, I made I, Alan a, a I, panelist. I, I am now. Sorry, Alan. I'm I sorry. Was, that's okay. I wasn't sure how to get through. Um, but certainly Mr. Severance did a fine job in explaining the circumstances to the board. Um, there's really not much I can add to what he already said. Um, Did you, know, you, understand, you understand the concern of Mr. Fleischer when we look at this survey that was provided uh, and, and the old garage lines up with the driveway at that point, but it appears that that side yard setback is less than what's being sought as part of this variance application. Now, Janice, we didn't have the benefit of the blown up, uh, more readable document. Um, can you shed any light on that? Um, essentially, it was it was the same as if you took a magnifying glass and looked at the survey that was provided with this application with a magnifying glass. 
it was still difficult to 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 determine but that that at least i can read the not the handwritten numbers that were on that survey so, so you're satisfied that that survey depicted a westerly side yard setback of 3.05 feet yes it just, it just it looks like an optical illusion that's why right I think uh, I'm looking at the same thing blown up on my phone, um, and um, I think part of the confusion is that the chain link fence is obviously not uh, on the property line, so there's probably four feet or more between the structure and the fence, but according to Mr. Help's survey, it looks like it's basically 3.05 feet, as was already stated. That that's That's... Correct, Alan. I've, I've measured it with the tape measure. It is um, right just under four feet from the garage to the chain link fence on the west side of the property. And then, as I mentioned, on the back side, it's, it's five from the northwest corner and five and a half feet from the northeast corner to the chain link fence. OK, so the chain link fence looks like it's three and a half or four feet away. I don't have the problem there. My problem is I don't know on whose property that chain link fence sits. That's my problem because when you look at it in the survey, I can't tell which is the fence, which is the property line, and which is closer. Because it's certainly close to three foot. Mr. Fleischer, Mr. Fleischer the, the survey that we've been presented with depicts that fence along the westerly property line as on the adjacent property, not on the subject property. That's what I thought. That's my point. It's, it's point eight on the adjacent property. It's not on our property at all. So the fence is not, that's what I'm saying. So when I look at it, or, and then I'm left with, like, again, if you're telling me you, you've looked at the numbers and the numbers are clear that they've got at least three foot there to the property line, then my discussion is finished. It was just a question that's unclear in the documents. That, that's, that's, those are the numbers that are on the document and, and based upon at least my measurements, to the extent the fence is eight inches to the west of the property line, then there's a little bit more than three feet from the side of the building to the property line. Okay, and then I'll ask the last question is, I don't see any leaders on the on the gutters that are around the garage. And where do the leaders let the water out? They uh, let the water out. Uh, it comes down. They funnel to the back and then over to the right side of the garage. Down, you can see a tree right there that Janice just pulled up. So they funnel okay. back down. They funnel down into our property on on that side. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Moore, do you have any questions? It, um, I, I don't, I don't. Do you have any questions? No, no questions. Mr. Church, do you have any questions? Am I unmuted? I unmuted you. Uh, no questions. Uh, okay, Mr. Okay. McCullough, do you have any questions? No questions, thank you. Uh, Ms. Harris, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Mr. Caulfield, do you have any questions? Uh, not at this time. Ms. Gilmore, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Okay, I I just have one, which is not really relevant. To this, but has the construction office come and looked at inspected the garage to verify there are no structural issues? Or they said you need a zoning permit. I'll deal with you. Your 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 last comment is spot on, Mr. Harrison. They they are unwilling to come look at it until they uh, find the outcome of the variance meeting. Bureaucracies are a wonderful thing. <laughs> I, I generally am wholly supportive of construction offices not processing permits until the zoning's been cleared, but this is a little different situation, but that's where we are. Okay. Um, 
Are there any members of the public who um, have questions, statements, testimony, comments, anything whatsoever they want to say about the application? Ms. Peretti, are you here for this application? No, I am not. There being no, no members of the public with comments. Okay. Um, Mr. Tremulak, Mr. Severance, do you want to have anything to say before we discuss and vote on the application? Um, something I would say, Mr. Chairman, I think it's obvious Mr. Severance tried to do the right thing here. Didn't realize that by taking down the garage, um, he required a variance to reconstruct the garage in the same place. And I think he assumed, like probably most people would, that uh, he was allowed to build the garage in the same location using the same foundation and obviously found out that wasn't the case. Um, and the, the garage is built as an attractive garage and um, uh, there's not much more to say about the application. Okay. We hope the board would look favorably on it. We'll just start discussion with Mr. Moore. You know, given the uh, circumstances of COVID and, you know, everything that went on during that time with your garage, uh, I'm in favor of this application. I don't uh, view it uh, proposing as a uh, that's permit. Um, uh, I th and um, I think the only hardship that was endured was probably um, your potential one. Um, and uh, so I'm in favor of the application. Mr. Simon. Um, I'm in favor. Mr. Church. Mr. Church, you're unmuted now. I'm in favor of the application. Okay. Mr. McCulloch. No comments. Um, Ms. Harris. I'm in favor. Mr. Corfield. Uh, I'm in favor. Um, Ms. Gilmer. I'm in favor. Mr. Fleischer. I'm in favor of the application as submitted. Okay. Um, I'm also in favor. I think, you know, that the applicant has, um, you know, normally we requiring at least three feet when garage is having closer uh, to side or rear yard stands. Um, then the ordinance requires and they're, they're closer than three feet, but here is maintaining three feet to the one side and more than that to the rear. Um, so I'm in favor of this will not result in a substantial detriment to the public good or substantial impairment to the zone plan. They, they just simply replace what was there. Um, someone want to make a motion? Move approval of the application as submitted. Is there a second? A second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any extensions? Okay. Um, with that, we'll take a break. I need to excuse myself from the next application because of a conflict. So, goodbye to everybody. And goodbye, the Bill. <laughs> goodbye. Do we want to take a five minute break, Chad? Yes, please. Let's have a five minute break. Okay, and we're going to at five to at five to ten.
Kevin, can, oh, wait a minute. Kevin, can you hear me? Kevin, can I you do. hear me? I yeah. just logged in a different way to see if you could maybe add me to the panelists one more time, but if not- It's, we'll it's, not, me, it's not highlighted as an option, so I can't. I'm not doing it. Okay. Um, what do you want to start with? Well, let me start with announcing the hearing. I just want to make sure I, ha I have the right exhibit. Are you going to do the- Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, good. So it takes a while to load the exhibits. All right. Um, I think everybody's back and we are, um, let me make sure we're on the recording. Yeah, and we're recording. Okay. Uh, the applicant, uh, Kevin Costello and Nicole Sobchik, owner of properties at 157, 159 Forest Street and 59 Chestnut Street, Montclair, New Jersey, filed an application with the Montclair Board of Adjustment for variance to construct two new family homes. The properties are on the R2 two family zone district. The properties are designated on the township maps, tax maps as lots 27 and 28 in block 3307. A variance is requested from Montclair Code 347-20. The applicant requires a variance of the number of dwellings on a lot. For one and two family dwellings, there should be no more than one principal building per lot. The applicant proposes a total of four principal buildings on one lot. Montclair Code 347-47, the applicant requires a variance of the permitted uses to locate three two-family dwellings and one four-family dwelling on one consolidated lot. Such use is not permitted in the zone. Montclair Code 347-47, the applicant requires a variance Permit to, permitted uses to construct the porch additions to the existing non-conforming four-family dwelling. Such use is not permitted in the zone. Montclair Code 347-45B2, the outcome requires a variance of the minimum required front yard setback for corner lots of 25 feet or the average of the two nearest principal structures. The proposed setback of the two new two-family dwellings from the front property line along Chestnut Street is 24 feet. The existing four-family dwelling has a front yard setback from Chestnut Street of 26.6 feet, and the existing two-family dwelling at 59 Chestnut Street has a front yard setback of 21.3, resulting in an average of 23.98 feet. Montclair Code Section 347-45D, or is that 347-347-45D? The proposed consolidated lot will result in a rear property line along the eastern property line adjacent to the NJ Transit Montclair Boonton line right of way. Required rear yard setback is 25% of the depth of the lot. The resultant consolidated lot will have a depth of 254.36 feet and a required rear yard setback of 63.6 feet. Thus, the existing building at 59 Chestnut Street with a rear yard setback of 30.9 feet will require variance relief. And Montclair's code 347-102B, the applicant requires a variance relief to provide parking spaces for two family dwellings smaller than the required nine feet by 19 feet. The applicant proposes nine foot by 18 foot parking spaces. Um, that's it. So uh, we're ready to go. Uh, Ms. Kelly, are the is the notice acceptable and the taxes paid? Uh, yes, both. Okay, Mr. Costello, would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? I do. Would you state your name and address, please? Kevin Costello, 157 Forest Street, Montclair. And Mr. Costello, you are not represented by an attorney in this application, is that correct? I am not, but I am accompanied by my wife, who's also here. Is she an attorney? I'm not an attorney, no. Oh, I thought no. Maybe, maybe there was a dual purpose there. <laughs> that would be helpful for this, but no, he's a co-applicant. Yes. Okay, and Mr. Costello, um, how many witnesses do you anticipate? I assume you're going to say something to the board, but how many witnesses, in addition to yourself, do you anticipate calling as part of this application? You know, I... I I have Rick Jarzembowski from Paul Sionis' office here um, if we need him, um, but I, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I mean, it, it, that's really all I have. 
Okay, well, why don't we proceed see how it goes? So why don't you describe to the board or however you want to proceed what's, what's going on with this application? Should we swear in my wife? If she's going to testify, we certainly can. So, so Nicole, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? Yes. State your name and address, please. Nicole Stupdick, 157 Forest Street, Montclair. Thank you. So, um, we purchased this prop. We moved to Montclair um, maybe four years ago, but purchased this property in 2018. It's a existing four family uh, house at the corner of Chestnut and Forest Street. Uh, we moved into one of the upstairs apartments. Uh, Mr. Costello, when you say this property, we're talking about lot 28 now? Um, let me confirm, but yes, 157. Yeah, lot 28, exactly. Okay. Um, so we moved into this house in 2018. Um, we have, have renovated one unit, um, the unit next to ours, which is now rented. Um, we've got an unrenovated unit. And we've got a unit that's kind of halfway through renovations. Um, the previous owner lived here for a time as a tenant, um, and we have tenants in two of the other units. Um, the lot is this property lot 28 um is kind of unique in the neighborhood this neighborhood has a lot of very small lots 25 and 35 foot lots um at one time this was the original home of grace church so we've kind of a little digging with the montclair history center and uh grace church has some records on it too um at one time this was their, their first location when they built the location over on uh, grove street they kind of tore down the steeple and tore off the whole roof structure and made this into a four family. Um, so it's been a four family uh, for a very long time, since the early 1900s. Um, 59 Chestnut we bought a year ago was owner occupied. That's a two family. It had been occupied by a, a single family, but it was that was actually uh, has been a two family, it looks like, since its original construction. Um, that lot, just because of kind of the way it's tucked in um, to, you know, with the New Jersey Transit um, to the east and with the large commercial building to the south is also kind of an exceptionally large lot. Combined, they're about 30,000 square foot, um, square feet uh, combined lots. So what we're proposing is um, to use kind of the back parking lot, there's an existing parking lot between 157 and 159 Forest Street and 59 Chestnut that services both homes. Um, the tenants of 59 Chestnut had always parked in this lot. Um, there'd been a little bit of neighborhood parking that had been allowed by the previous owner um, between the lots. But if by combining the lots, I can push all the parking into the kind of tuck it into the backyard of 59 Chestnut and that would allow uh, for the creation of two more two family homes between the two existing structures. So there's, there's currently six units on the property. We're proposing an additional four. So 10, 10 units total. Um, the four units are all mirror images of each other, the same, you know, layouts. They're two bedroom, you two bedroom, one and a half or no, two bedroom, two and a half bath units. Um, there's an existing uh, kind of like subterranean garage that sits off of uh, Chestnut Street. Um, there's a lot of these garages. I, I've been told when the when the train overpass was built, these were kind of given to to the property owners along that block of Chestnut Street um, because they've got these big retaining walls and they're put in their front yards. And so uh, there's several, there's a few on the opposite side of Chestnut Street. Um, on my side of Chestnut, there's just the one that's kind of underneath the front yard of 59 Chestnut Street. It's a single car garage. Um, since we've kind of owned the property at 157 Forest, I've never seen that used by the 59 Chestnut um, uh, Street uh, tenants. They always parked uh, in the lot that's behind 157 Forest because it's, uh, is a little bit easier you don't have to go up the stairs so uh, parking is um, proposed to be 20 spaces where I think 17 is required um, you know kind of the goal of the application was even though this is combining two lots and making kind of one large lot with with four houses on it 
that they still kind of maintain the neighborhood and kind of they look like individual homes, not like a garden apartment complex. So we kind of match the, the spacing and density of the uh, homes across the street on Chestnut and, and similarly across the street on, uh, on Forest Street. Um, entrance and exit to the, to the parking would still be on the existing driveway off of Forest Street. Um, that's how the entrance and exit happens now. It gets a little bit wider. Um, the new units are a little bit unique in that everybody's going to enter them from this driveway and parking area on the south side. Um, but they face out on the chestnut on the north side. So they almost kind of end up with two front facades. Um, we wanted it to look like the front of the houses, like they do across the street on chestnut. Um, but really, everybody's going to be entering them uh, from the south side. On the south side entrance, there's a small patio for each unit. On the north side, um, there's, a, there's another kind of, like I said, another door uh, that would take you out to a very small yard. Um, there's an existing wrought iron fence along the top of the retaining wall on Chestnut Street that would remain um, and actually be, we'd have to do some restoration to it. It needs a little bit of work. Um, it's been there a long time. Um, the grade is such that at the corner of Chestnut and Forest Street, um, the wall is, you know, maybe eight inches tall. And then as you get down towards the, the train overpass and towards the front of 59 Chestnut, it's, you know, eight or nine feet tall at least. So it gets pretty dramatic there. And that's how that garage is tucked in. Um, we've got a landscape and a lighting plan um, done by uh, Paul Sionis uh, with all native plantings. Um, we lose a couple of the oak trees that are in the, um, where the new houses are proposed. There's one in pretty bad shape right along the driveway. And greens along the driveway that are kind of tucked up into the eaves of the house that are going to go. We do retain uh, the biggest oak tree there. And then there's a lot of uh, hardwood trees and, and uh, shade trees between 59 Chestnut and the University Transit property that all remain. Um, there's a couple of large trees that go or that would be removed where the new parking is proposed. Um, but in general, we, we tried to save as much as we could and, and proposed all native plantings. Um, there's also uh, a couple of a porch addition um, proposed for the existing four family home. Um, our porch is just kind of, it was never, it was built in kind of an odd way um, in that the, the, the roof of the porch currently follows the roof line of the house. So out at the railing, it's it's a very low roof line, like maybe five foot five or something like that. And the, the porch is just, it, it's it's kind of falling apart. It's a, uh, we have a lot of wood rot and stuff. So I'm proposing to kind of make a flat roof on that instead so that you could actually see out of it and then extend that, that um, porch out a little bit and it extends, there's an old addition off the back of the house. Um, we extend the porch to the end of the addition um, to give some outdoor space to those uh, four tenants there. Um, the existing two family would remain a two family. Um, no real additions to that except for uh, a deck off the back. The second tenant doesn't really have any great outdoor space. Um, we will divide up the side yard towards the train tracks, but we wanted to give them also some outdoor space, you know, at the same level as their unit. Um, the lower tenant does have a front porch so that the second floor tenant um, gets a, a deck, which is kind of how they would enter the property. Um, as I said, the proposed units are two bedroom with a small study. Um, Two and a half staff. We had uh, went to the development review committee and got some good feedback from them. They were generally very supportive of the application. Um, they thought the one extra bedroom upstairs, the second bedroom upstairs was a little small. Um, so we extended that a little bit. They thought the siding, there was some board and batten proposed, some vertical board and batten proposed um, on the new house elevations. They thought it didn't really match up with the rest of the uh, houses that are existing. Um, so they had us go back to just regular um, horizontal siding on it. Um, my house, the 157 Forest has uh, aluminum siding over wood siding. 
um, that we're going to remove the aluminum siding. We're proposing to save the wood siding if it's worth saving, if there's something under there that's good. If not, it would be like a hardy plank replacement. Um, the house at 59 Chestnut has asbestos siding, but it's in pretty good shape. Um, we're going to see if we can paint it, do all new windows. The roof is fairly new. Um, that house has actually pretty good bones to it. Um, it, it needs a lot of work in interior, but the exterior is actually quite nice with the front porch and the, um, you know, it's got some nice dormers to it. I, we kind of like those houses. Um, so that's really it for the application. Um, do you have any questions or comments? Members of the board, any questions or comments from anyone? No one, okay, I, if, if no one's gonna ask any questions or comments, I'll, I'll start, <laughs> which, I, which I hate having to do, <laughs> actually. Uh, I think there's at least one extra building on this application. I really do, and I'd like to go back to the site plan and maybe back to that photograph that we saw at the very beginning before the presentation started of the view from Chestnut Street. Can we do that, Janice? I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring up the photos. Okay. There we go. The view from Chestnut Street. Yeah, that, I think that's the one. Yeah, far left. Uh, which, which photo do you want? One, two, three. The one on the left. Far left. Okay, there you go. Um, my reaction to this application is there is one extra two family unit that shouldn't be there. First of all, we're dealing with now a consolidated lot. And oh, by it's a large lot. It's also already got on the lot a four family structure and a two family structure. If you divided it into conforming lots at the moment, you couldn't do what you're trying to do. So you're consolidating them. But if you look at that grove of trees and everything else, I think you were going to lose a lot of those trees with two buildings. I have a real concern about this, and I then have a real concern about the spacing between the buildings on what is essentially a virgin property under any circumstances. It's not the kind of spacing under the regulations that we would allow now. This is a unique site, and I think it's already, it already has on the site six units. I think eight units is fine. I think personally think 10 is too much, so I need an explanation. I also think that if you reduce it to eight units, you'd be able to get rid of some of the impervious surface and retain more of the existing uh, grass areas and tree areas and still be able to get another two family unit in there. I'm really concerned about having four um, independent structures on this property. And when you look at the elevation you show of the scale of the two family that exists, and then you compare the two families that you're putting there, you have the two families that are being put in almost at the same scale as the four family unit. It's just too much building on a site that has a very different vision when you're coming up Chestnut Street now as being an open space and all of a sudden we're filling in with two additional very large structures. So I need you to go a lot further and explain to me why you think that from a pure planning perspective, which has to be the basis for granting these variances, that it isn't in fact detrimental and that it isn't in fact overloading a property. I'm also concerned about putting in more parking spaces than are required for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is that the building behind this property, which we approved about two years ago or a year ago, was granted a parking variance 
with the explanation that the spaces weren't needed. And I don't know who's going to use there for the extra spaces that are now proposed on this site. So I would hate to see more parking put on what is essentially an open site and suddenly making it more pavement than is necessary to meet the needs of the structures on the site. So, and lastly, because it came up when we had the discussion on the property to the south of you, that street, Forest Street, is very bad from a traffic standpoint. It's a real nightmare most of the time with the school on the opposite corner. Um, that street is always parked full. It is always crowded. And part of the explanation when we approved that previous project to the south of you was, well, we're only going to go in on the Forest Street side. We're not going to come out on the Forest Street side. Because we, you had the, that outlet to the back near the, uh, near the boot and line right of way. So it seems to me that what you're asking for significantly overbuilds the site with buildings of a scale that are larger than typical of the existing two family structure there. And as I said, physically as large as the four family structure. And, and I'd like to get that elevation put back up again, Janice, if we can. So thank you, Mr. Fleischer, um, while, while Janice is bringing that up. So uh, the frontage along Chestnut Street is 236 feet. So this is a neighborhood that if you've been over there, you know, it's very small lots. I mean, predominantly 25 foot lots. There's a lot of 30 foot lots. Um, that's the predominant lot type over there. And so 236 feet supporting four buildings, even if one is as large as it is, seems like that the spacing is kind of very consistent with what's there. If you look the block right across the Chestnut Street, you've got five structure in the same exact amount of frontage. In fact, maybe a little less. You've got five structures on that size, four multifamilies. Some are two family, most are three family and a commercial building with the, with the pizza shop and apartments over it. If you go down Forest Street on the same block, those are 25 foot lots with two, all two family structures. So there, right there, yeah, that's a, right there you have five structures, including the commercial building. So I think the, the, the spacing and the density is really consistent what's there. It's a, the, the side yard setbacks in that zone is six feet. I can tell you almost none of the houses, especially the ones on 25 and 30 foot lots have six feet um, side yard setbacks. So that would be, but if you did, if they were conforming, there'd be roughly 12 feet between the, between houses. What we're proposing is between 11 and 12 feet between all the structures, between 11 and 13 feet between the four proposed structures. Well, so it's I, seem largely, con you know, if you look at a, especially if you look at a tax map, um, which I think Janice has one here somewhere. It, I think it's easy to tell kind of the predominant lot size. That's what we want it to look like is that these are individual homes. I don't think it should be clear to anyone driving down Chestnut Street that this is a 10 unit apartment complex or whatever you want to call it. It should look like individual two family homes, which is what, it was what the goal was of the um, of the architecture that we did there. I, I understand the response, but those houses on the other side of the street are of a much different scale than the two houses that you're putting in there. The two houses you're putting in there are taller and considerably wider than those houses. And what you're doing is you're saying, I want to put in a scale of house that would not be permitted in this zone. If that you couldn't divide this lot up, if you could divide this lot up and put in those two houses, I would almost buy your argument. But you couldn't. You couldn't get the side yard lines that are required. You I mean, need so a, you be within a couple be, of it. Well, let me finish. You you couldn't cover more than sixty five percent of the frontage of the lot width. And you couldn't be as close as you are to all of those buildings, including the four story, the four family building, which on its own would require a much deeper rear yard lot. So 
What I'm saying is that four-story building should have a much deeper rear yard lot in any, under any circumstances. And what we're trying to do is we're putting in there, and if, even if you look at the two-family home on the left side, look at the scale of the width of that house. Now, if you're going to tell me you're willing to put up two, two family homes of that scale, I get it. But that's not what you're proposing. You're proposing homes that are much, much larger than that scale of the one near the railway uh, uh, right of way. And that scale is more of the scale of the houses on the other side. So what you're doing is you're ignoring the rear yard kind of thing you would expect to have with the fourth family building. And you're creating side yards that are small by any standard and particularly small because with the minimum of 60, with the maximum of 65% width that you could build otherwise on a lot, you couldn't possibly get those two structures in there. And you'd also have considerably larger lot areas on one side or the other. And certainly you'd have a larger lot size for the back of that four store, four family structure, which it essentially has now. It has that entire open space as its rear yard. So to me, and I, I don't know, no, no other member of the board made any comments on this. I think this is being overbuilt. And if you go back to the picture, the impact it's gonna have on those beautiful and large mature trees, leaving essentially a 12 foot space between the rear of the four family building and, the, and, and this structure, you're gonna lose a number of trees and it's gonna to totally change the sense of openness that exists there now. So my own reaction is the buildings you're building are not on the same scale as the ones on the other side of the street and not even of the same scale as the one on your side of the street. And they're much too tightly packed on the current standards. I mean, we have places in town where there are 30 foot lots and we allow 25 foot wide buildings. But even there, we're concerned about the scale. And here, if we want to put on the lots, then they have to be much smaller scale buildings. If you want to go, in my opinion, if you want to put four buildings on a single lot, lots which by them are in and of their own would not allow more than a single building on any lot. And instead we're combining two lots and creating four buildings. I can buy a third building. I, I, I personally can't buy a fourth. And my fellow board members may have a totally different opinion on this thing. I'm also concerned about the added traffic that resulting from the number of parking spaces and everything else you're putting in there. I'm also worried about the amount of impervious surface that is essentially being added to the site. And you've essentially taken away what becomes the rear yard of the one existing just older building that's on the site. So I have a lot of problems with the number of structures you're putting there. And I, my, I myself have lost the grip on the plan on, the, on why this is a proper fit for the site. But right now you don't have that person as part of your team at the moment. So it's not about the architecture. It's about the scale of the buildings, the size of the property, the amount of impervious surface, and the number of structures. I don't believe there should be more than at most one more structure added to this site. And so I, I need someone to convince me that this site legitimately can take these added structures. The fact that we're not even really using the front yards here, so the notion of houses facing on the street doesn't exist, even though it's sort of being faked with sort of fake entries to make it look like it's on the street when it's not. I just think it's, it's wrong. I think it's the wrong, it's too much on this site and it's not set up the right way to both preserve the trees, the landscape, a reasonable amount of space behind the four family house and sufficient space between the more, the older, more historic structure and the new structures. I just think there's not enough room to put in two more structures. I, so, I hear you, Mr. Fletcher. I just, you know, you said that the spacing would not be appropriate 
anywhere any in in any place it would be too too tight but it's exact it's it's not as tight as any of the houses in this neighborhood the houses on the forest street on the houses, i get it, i know but they're all of a different scale but they, they are not as good as a driveway on that on that okay one. i i i'm not gonna I, I don't want to debate it with you. I'm stating oh, my concerns. I do not think four structures on the site is appropriate. I think you could add another two-family home, nicely spaced from both the existing two-family home and from the four-family home, which I think is entitled to a large rear yard. It is a multifamily dwelling in a two-family district. I just think you're, tr you're putting too much on the site that isn't necessary. I'd also like to see the parking restricted only to that which is absolutely required by the number of units. It's just uh, parking is impervious as as pervious surface, grass, lawn, anything other than, and not to mention the fact you actually have to get an easement for the to use for a driveway on that other property we just discussed before. That is to the south of this. This site is not set up for four structures with one entry point, essentially, for vehicles. It's just not set up for four structures. That's my sense. And, and I'd love to hear from other members of the board, but that's that's their decision if they wanna if they wanna chime in on anything. Um, any other members of the board with anything to comment yeah, on? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, just, I have a question actually. Um, is the reason that you're trying to combine these lots so that you can share the parking on both of the spaces? It looks like the new structures are on the Forest Street lot um, and not on the, the Chestnut Street lot. Is that right? That's correct. We wouldn't have to have, you know, cross access for all the parking. You know, we wanted, we consolidated the parking into the very deep 59 Chestnut lot. Okay. And then how how are you dealing with water on the site with stormwater? So there's a um, Paul Anderson did a did a grading and drainage plan. Um, there is an inlet on Most of it is taken to the rear uh, and an inlet is added to the center of that back parking lot. So water goes down the driveway to the back parking lot. And then there's a existing storm sewer in the back there. So we'd be adding a type E inlet in the corner of that uh, parking area. On Chestnut Street, you mean? Uh, the Chestnut Street lot in the back of that parking area? Yes. And then, I mean, I know Mr. Fleischer has concerns about the scale of this building, but you're um, you're proposing to add two new buildings to a lot that already has, has a primary structure. Was there any thought given to consolidating that into one building instead of having two two new structures on the site? Um, you know, the building is kind of you don't see four family structures built new uh, anymore because once you get over three units, you end up needing elevator and sprinklers, um, whereas two family structures do not. So it just doesn't really become financially, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, even my building now, the four family we're sitting in right now, if we built this new, we would need a small elevator and a, and a full sprinkler system, which is just, it doesn't it make financial sense for a project of that scale. How about, you know, a, a three family in one building? Um, probably do a three family. It still requires a sprinkler. It wouldn't require an elevator. Sprinklers are tough in a three family. You know, what we tried to do with the height of these, the, the existing four family and the existing two family are two and a half stories. We propose these as two stories. Um, I think it'd be tough to make a three family and not go you know, more vertical with it, which I don't know if that's going to take it in the direction that we want it to as far as, you know, getting the scale that we're looking for that, that Joe's talking about. Yeah, we wanted to just keep the, the neighborhood 
look and feel of it. Um, definitely not wanting to give any any sort of um, impression that it's like an apartment building, so to speak, more homes, home-like structures like our neighbors have. Um, and then also just to address the point, I know you um, brought it up and uh, also ties back to the parking. There are a few extra parking spaces to uh, offer to our neighbors who, um, you know, seek parking and, and uh, I think appreciate having the option to rent a parking spot from us uh, when needed. So we, we wanted to maintain that as an option for those uh, neighbors who need them. The, the adjacent houses on Forest Street, uh, they none of, they're so close together that none of them have parking, have driveways. Same thing with the neighbors across the street on Chestnut. They're, all those houses are tight enough and with the grade, they don't have any opportunity. You can't fit cars between the two houses. So we ha we've been, our previous owner of this house had always you know, made the lot available to neighborhood people. Um, I can certainly reduce the parking. Uh, we could go down to the 17 required if the board wants to, but uh, you're asking about what the, what the use would be for the extra. We just make those available to our neighbors. And, and it also, just because uh, there was mention of the flow, the traffic flow earlier, um, we really would want to go about it, um, you know, similarly where uh, we have a flow in off of Forest Street and then control the flow through the back parking lot. I think what she's saying is there's, there's an opportunity <laughs> to do a one-way drive. Um, it's not what's shown on here. I do have a photo. Um, right now, you can drive straight through. If, you could, if you're in that lot behind 59 Chestnut, if you were parked back there, you could drive straight through out to Erie Street. You'd, you'd go over the uh, New Jersey Transit um, setback. Yeah, there. So that's like standing at the corner of 151 Forest, the commercial building in the back. Straight behind the photo taker would be the backyard of, you know, the back of 59 Chestnut. Um, that dumpster enclosure is shown on the on the site plan there. You can drive through there. You just drive over the New Jersey Transit um, right of way. You know, we could we could make that a one way drive. I would probably instead of doing it over New Jersey Transit property, I would probably work out something with um, Mr. Foster to move the the dumpster enclosure. A, you could probably slide that forward and make it. There's enough room there between the property line and the corner of that building. There's eleven feet. Like Dave, we still got the sign. I think like twelve feet. You, you could certainly make a driveway out that way that went out to Erie Street, similar to what we did at One Fifty One Forest. If the traffic was an issue, we generally find that ability for the sign is especially so residential. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if it's Thank an office goodness. complex, everybody kind of comes at once, and everybody kind of leaves at once. If it's the you know the co-op school, everybody comes at once. We that. <laughs> residential is very random. Different people have different schedules, especially people kind of that want apartments that are a three minute walk to the Walnut Street train station like this. Um, the majority of our tenants now, they take a train to work. So I, I really don't think the traffic, I understand that Forest Street is tough, it's narrow, and on, on school days it can get a little crazy. I, I don't think the addition of, you know, four cars to that area, um, it leaves at random times or a lot of them don't leave at all. Um, during the week is going to, you know, kind of significantly alter the traffic pattern uh, in that neighborhood. We definitely don't um, find ourselves like, running on, into um, each other, coming church. in and out of the driveway just or anything like that. Out. Like it's very like, much uh, you know, tech issue. low traffic yeah. using the driveway. Seven forty-five. I have a motion to reopen. Um, so we we have a lot of confidence that it would be more than sufficient. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is John McCullough. So um, you raised the question about financial feasibility, and I'm, I'm wondering: I mean, would would a, would a, a two-family unit not be financially feasible? Uh, certainly, you could do a two-family there. You know, um, from a this is kind of a unique property and this is our home, but it's also an investment property. So 
more units for us would be better, <laughs> you know, and it seemed like an appropriate kind of density for this neighborhood. Um, you know, my wife and I are, my wife sits on the environmental commission. Um, she does sustainability work for L'Oreal. I, I studied landscape architecture and some planning in college. I, I we're very much into the kind of transit oriented development, mm -hmm. um, which this is a perfect project for. If you're going to have any sort of density in a town like Montclair, it should probably be focused at the train stations. Um, and this is a fairly dense neighborhood. Um, uh, if Janice, you know, the density I know has come up. If Janice could show a couple, I had a couple neighborhood pictures there. We already looked at the one on Chestnut, but I took another one on Forest Street there. Um, that it's it's a dense neighborhood. We we have twenty five foot lots um, with almost full coverage. Um, you know, none of those houses have driveways between them because they're only about you know five or six feet between the houses. That's like kind of kitty corner across the street. You can see the corner of the co op in the right hand side there. Um, the other side of this forest street looks the exact same as that too. The you know the the up uh, exactly. There's the other side of forest street. They're very close together. Um, it's all two family and three family homes. And, you know, it's a lot of people that commute to the city. They walk, it's a five minute walk to the, to the train station. So, um, could you do a two family there? Yeah. You could also leave it like it is and make it a big parking lot. But, um, we kind of believe in this transit oriented density. Um, and I think, you know, it's not pushing it to the point where you like decrease the quality of the living experience there. Everybody has a lot, an outdoor, you know, yard area. Everybody has an outdoor patio. Everybody has off street parking, which is kind of unheard of in this neighborhood. Um, and the houses are 11 to 13 feet apart, um, which is, you know, the, the standard uh, side yard setback in that neighborhood is six feet. So it, it, it didn't seem aggressive to us. Um, like I said, we went for two story instead of two and a half because they are wider than the general, um, than the houses kind of uh, immediately adjacent to them, but they're not. So we kind of went not as tall to kind of not be too aggressive with it. Um, I mean, there's an option there if we really were concerned about spacing to instead of, we haven't even gotten to the architectures, uh, the architecturals, but um, these are side by side units. So they're two story units, but everybody has an internal stair. Um, hope we can get to that. Um, Mr. Mr. Costello, so, let me just stop you for one second. I think, Mr. Costello, just hold on one second. So, I mean, there is there are big variances that you need as part of this application. There are two D1 applications that you've requested. I mean, the first one, you're seeking four buildings on a lot where a maximum of only one is allowed. And the second is, uh, you're seeking approval to locate three two-family dwellings and one four-family dwelling on the one consolidated lot uh, that use is not permitted in the zone. The, these these use variances, you know, require um, special reasons in order to be approved. They require proofs that the uh, the approval by the board will not cause substantial detriment to the public good. That is the impact on area properties. There's also a requirement that the applicant prove that this type of an application will not substantially impair the intent and purpose of the zone plan. Also, under the Medici case law, you also need to prove the enhanced quality of proof that this type of an application is not inconsistent with the intent and purpose of the master plan. So there's a lot of proofs that are necessary to in order for the board to approve this type of application. In addition, um, a regularly constituted board is seven members, and you will need five affirmative votes to get such an approval. So you, you hear there's a threshold issue here as to whether or not there's an overutilization of the site, both visually with these multiple buildings and perhaps with intensity of use. So I think that's what the board is struggling with at the moment. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. I, I, uh, one of the reasons why I asked about uh, putting a, a two-family unit is because, it, of course, uh, it would also preserve uh, green space, which I think uh, would uh, be beneficial to the neighborhood, uh, just given the congestion. But um, I, I wonder also, I mean, that, you know, given the fact that um, a lot of people that live in that area are, are transit uh, passengers, if you consider the possibility of, of 
rather than make a two family unit, one building that has a series of studio apartments, for example. You know, that would give you a greater number of, of tenants, but uh, wouldn't necessarily require um, additional buildings. Uh, I wonder if you consider that as a possibility. And then the last thing, if you would speak to me, is uh, uh, your thoughts about uh, affordable housing as part of your plan. Well, I think, if, Mr. McCullough, if I could, I, I note in the planning memo under planning considerations on page seven, the applicant uh, will be required to comply with Montclair Code section 202-42A mm -hmm. and, and pay development fees. That's correct. This application does not trigger the requirement for an affordable using unit on site. Does not. Does not. No. So, you know, as Janice said, it's not required because it's four proposed units, uh, whereas five is the trigger. You know, um, the two family home on uh, 59 Chestnut on directly adjacent to the New Jersey Transit property kind of the adjacency to the train tracks kind of is its own limiting factor as far as you know rent is concerned you know these are not there's not a luxury apartment building which seems to be a lot of what's being built in montclair there's no we don't have amenities or anything like that um we don't we're not proposing any you know deed restricted affordable housing or anything like that but i think this kind of fits into a very kind of middle market need for apartments you know they're only they're two bedroom apartments they're not kind of these big three bedroom uh giant apartments um they're fairly close to the train tracks they're close to transit um i think they're going to kind of be a, a middle of the road apartment um as far as did we consider multiple studio apartments uh i didn't really uh, it's a two family zone um <laughs> we kind of tried to stay consistent with doing two family homes. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Sullivan, uh, with the need for proofs, um, the positive and negative criteria. I'm familiar. It, it seems like um, we're probably going to be back, um, coming back to the board and not having a vote tonight, it feels like. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to at least get a little bit more feedback from the board. I, I've only heard from a couple members. I, I'd like to hear a little more feedback to know kind of what we should come back with. And I'd also like to kind of throw out, you know, a little bit of, of, of possibilities that could work for this site. You know, we have, we, we were gonna go to the architecturals on this. We have side-by-side -side units proposed here with an internal stair for each unit. Um, as far as a quality of an apartment, that's a lot more desirable to having someone living above or below you, mostly for sound reasons. Um, so that's what we propose. But because you do it that way, you end up with what Joe kind of noted was you end up with a fairly wide unit. So like 18 to me is kind of the minimum width of a, of a unit. Um, you see railroad apartments in Jersey City and Hoboken that are that are more like 12 or even less than that. But 18 feels like kind of uh, the standard. So you end up with a 36 foot wide uh, two family. Now, the two family at 59 Chestnut is not a side by side. It's a stack top and bottom so you could certainly you know maybe make that unit more like 20 or 22 feet wide or something like that but stack them and you'd still get your same number of units there which as i said seems consistent with the neighborhood but you would get a lot more green space you'd get a lot more spacing between the units you'd probably get a nice side yard in addition to a backyard and a, and a front patio for these units um the density would be would be the same as far as units per acre um, which for a giant, you know, for a 30,000 square foot lot seems appropriate, but you'd have a lot more green space. You'd probably save at least a couple more of those big trees. Um, and you just have a lot more space in general, as far as parking, if the board felt strongly that there should be less parking, I'm certainly open to reducing some spots. Um, this, this is a parking starved neighborhood, even though it is transit oriented neighborhood. Um, I'll, I'll really let the board kind of decide what they think we should do with that. But um, that's a possibility that, you know, we could always come back with um, if it seemed more appropriate for the neighborhood. 
Mr. Costello, I, I think you made a good point, and I think we've heard back from the vice chairman and a couple of other board members, and I think the remaining board members should comment on uh, whether they think the fourth building is appropriate and whether or not the uh, total density of 10 units on the site is appropriate. And then I think the applicant will get better guidance because I think it's it's clear what we've heard this far thus far that a, a revision to the plans would be appropriate. So let's hear what the other board members have so he gets some guidance. Uh, hi, this is uh, Jerry Simon. Um, I'm in agreement that uh, two additional buildings uh, would not, uh, I would not be in favor of that. Uh, the, the applicant's argument that the small lot sizes on Forest Avenue um, gives them justification uh, to, to so squeeze in properties actually work against them, in my opinion. I, I think the space is at a premium in the location, and by trying to pack it in, uh, it actually uh, is a negative, uh, uh, in my view. Um, I I consider uh, one additional building uh, based on what the design is and what the, the spacing uh, overall, uh, what the potential view would be from the from the from the various angles. But I, I agree, just on a proceeding with two buildings is, is just too much. This is Jay Church. Church. Okay. You got you, me? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Uh, I would echo uh, Mr. Fleischer's comments uh, quite readily. Uh, I think that uh, the development we have before us over overutilizes that property. It puts it increases the density in a very dense area, and it takes away green space that doesn't need to be taken away. And I don't think it adds to the uh, plan, the city plan that we have in mind. I think that we're just putting, we're just using up too much of our open space with these kinds of developments. I think that as I looked at it today, uh, the uh, use of the property with one building added to it, be it two, uh, two family or three family, would be a much better idea depending on the design of the building. Uh, the, um, the use that they're presenting today is too dense. It goes against what the board has voted on in the past about density. And uh, I think that we, we've got to kind of put a stop to these kinds of developments that use up property just for the sake of return on investment at the maximum. So uh, I would uh, not vote in favor of this application. I think that uh, resubmittal of another application without the dense buildings on it would be considered depending on the plan. Mr. Church, let me ask you a question. So sure. you're in favor of elimination of one of the buildings. Um, the current application proposes two new buildings with four dwelling units, but as I understand it, there's and the board should make it clear what they're looking for, because um, if the applicant comes back with a single building, uh, are three units appropriate, at least what the board sees so far, or is I, it more I, two units I, appropriate? I would say a two unit, one building with two units because of the density, of, uh, the which you have in that area is you have, a, you have two schools in effect. You have Montclair High School, then across the street, you have uh, another school. Uh, and it is too congested. So I think putting two uh, a building on there with uh, four units in it just adds to the problem. It doesn't help the problem. I think that we're, we're just going to add to the problem of that neighborhood. I think that we put a three unit, one building with three units in it, that's a possibility, and and you'd have more green space, and uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't really attack the density problem. But I think that it'd be less than two uh, bringing eight people, eight families, 
and adding to uh, four and two, having 10 families in there is just too much. So, so yeah, Mike, I understand needs. it. As I understand it, you're in favor of eliminating one of the building, providing That's for it. one new building with two or three units in the building. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Uh, do you want some more comments from the board? Uh, yeah, I'd, like to, I'd like to get as many as we can. Yeah, it's just very hard. This, 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 this online. Joe, usually you can just go down the line. But that being said, Kevin and Nicole, um, be interested if you could just look at the block and maybe sub, like what what can you build on this block? Like you know, if it was divided, subdivided, consolidated, what can be built on this block? I think it's too much. I think you you've overextended yourself. By putting the two houses on here, and you know, when you came to the board and with the three variances and didn't have the lawyers and the planners and that thing, I, you know, I felt like you were just trying to get our ideas, and that's a good thing because it's good to talk about what is good for this lot. And I think having you guys both live on this site and have an invested interest is very important in this. And I, you know, I can see that this area could be better. Like the walls, need, this, this, these properties need a little bit of attention in some sense. And I'm on that block a lot. And it's, it's a quiet block. You guys are elevated high. You know, I wouldn't necessarily hear that much, but it, you know, it is a quiet block in that sense. And I, and I think that you should honor that by, you know, bring something in there that doesn't overdo it is what I would, what I would expect. And I, and I think that, I think both of you know that in some sense. And I think, you can achieve that some way. Thank you. Any other members of the board? Yes. Um, you know, I, I'm conflicted because on one end I uh, do, um, I under, you know, I, I can see some positivity from the standpoint of, of developing uh, two, two families on this property um, and then on the other hand um i also understand my colleagues points and, and it makes sense we don't want to you know overdevelop on the lot um i think it's you know i think it's a a good proposal i think that it certainly um helps to act value to utilize area um but uh you know just kind of um you know, here doing some some looking at the plans and listening to my colleagues and just everything. I, you know, I guess it would be good to come back with a revision. Um, maybe maybe a three unit, right? So if you can't get four out of it, you can you can get three. Um, but you know, something that uh, something that will kind of help revitalize this area but also you know like you said from a financial standpoint you know with the units uh, will still be advantageous to you as well um so uh yeah i would say just um come back to us with a revised plan um and you know do something that looks you know creative but also um uh, helps continue with the character uh, on the block in which it resides. Okay, okay. I, I, I appreciate the board's feedback. I don't know if there's anyone else that wants to. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one thing, Kevin. Um, think of that four story, that four family building. Think of the real yard that building has had. There is no place in this township that you could build a building of that scale with a rear yard of a, what amounts for that building at least, a rear yard in that building of about 12 feet. It, there's just not enough breathing room around this Baltimore, I won't call it historic because the history of it dates back a very long time ago, but the four family unit needs a lot more breathing space. So if we're moving towards a lesser density on the site, try to retain 
a reasonable rear yard for that unit which faces on Forest Street because it's sort of a side yard to one of the units and a rear yard to the other, um, which is the strange part because the unit next to the right of way, we're now calling that a rear yard, when in fact, historically, it's been a side yard and functions as a side yard. But I think there needs to be more breathing space around the four unit building, which means if you're going to a single building, it should move further east and give the four family uh, building a bit more breathing room around. I think that would help and it would also help preserve some of the trees which are primarily focused nearer to that four family building. Yeah, I, I really think the the size of the lot is a benefit to kind of, I think there's a way to incorporate all this stuff that, that the board is looking for, give kind of that breathing room. We've got basically 120 feet between the two existing structures. Right. So it's a lot of room. A lot of that is taken up right now because, you know, we did side by side units. I'd like to at least look at it as two stacked units. I think if it, it's 120 feet between the buildings and you had 25 foot units, you'd still have, you know, 25 foot yard. Or, no, no, that big. I, I think, you know, Kevin, Kevin, I, think you, yard, I hear you. I think if you think of it as if you were subdividing the property into three lots, you figure out where the best lot lines would be, if you will. And I'm just suggesting that you do need more breathing room around the four unit structure if you can get it. The rest is up to you. Yeah, yeah. 236 feet on Chestnut Street. So we kind of thought, you know, for you, if you divide that by four, that's 60 foot lots. And I know that's not really what we're not we're proposing, but that's how we came up with a number of four structures. It's mostly 30 foot and 40 foot lots in the neighborhood. You divide that whole frontage by four, it, you're, you know, you get 60 foot. Understood. You know what I mean? So that's where we kind of got the number of units, but I can see how we could definitely space them much differently and use the space right. more efficiently. I don't, I don't, I don't hear a lot of support for four structures on the site, and that's, but that's your decision and your call. You're the applicant, so that's up to you. Understood. Um, as far as as far as uh, traffic and parking, I mean. It didn't seem to me that making a one-way drive and kind of having more cross-access easements and possibly involving New Jersey Transit made much sense. I think the parking is, for this development, whatever that ends up being, is always going to be where it's proposed. Um, did anybody have a problem with a, with a two-way drive aisle in the existing location or feel strongly I, about it has to be a one-way? I assume you've already gotten an agreement from Mr. Plofka to uh, that right for the easement. That's that's obvious. I think the issue is by reducing the number of units and putting in the parking that's required. And if you want to put in one or two guest spaces, that's fine. But beyond that, I, I think there's been a lot of pressure on parking in that area. And we're not trying to make this site responsible for taking in the parking of the neighborhood. That's not, I don't think in the end that's beneficial because it just allows for more density to come in. So I think you should put in a number of units you can live with in three structures and put in the required parking and maybe one or two guest spaces. And I think you come closer to the mark. But it's your call and it's your application and it's your investments. And we understand that. Understood. Well, I appreciate the board taking the time to review it and kind of give us feedback. Um, we'll kind of go back to the drawing board and I think we can come up with something that works for everybody. Mr. Right, Chair, so we want to give the public the opportunity to comment. The public should understand. Yes, anybody that's here, anybody that's here should certainly be asked for comment or questions for the applicant. After Ms. Already. Ms. Peretti, do you have any comments? Ms. Peretti, I've, I've unmuted you. Do you have any comments or questions? Sounds like none. 
we, we can't hear it, so. Yeah, There's, there are no comments. Okay. Okay, so let me ask, let me ask the applicant, Mr. Costello, um, you're gonna ask the board to carry the application so you can review it and perhaps submit a revised plan. Is that your request? Yes. So Janice, you know, we just carried two applications to the December 16 meeting. When would you schedule this matter? Well, I, I, let, let me ask you a question because I'm not quite so familiar, familiar with, I, we have, um, I've we got, have a tight calendar, Jan we have a tight calendar, Janice, because we, did, we couldn't fit in a special meeting, which was requested by two other applicants. I, I understand. I, I, I think we already have uh, on, the, on the 16th, we've got Highgate Hall. Did they already start their presentation before yes. the board? Yes. So they're on the agenda for the 16th. But, um, and we've got the, the two residential. So we could put this on the agenda for the 16th and see if we get to it. Or it would have to go till January. I, I want to ask something different, Michael. If the number of structures on the site is reduced, which would be a significant change, do you have to do any re-noticing or would that meet, the, or are we within the criteria with that kind of significant change that may change the type of variances that are needed? I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just asking the question. I think the, the contraction of number of buildings from four to three would not require re-notice. Good, okay. So, you know, and, and then, and, and, and a resulting reduction in intensity of use by reduction in the number of units. Again, although it's different, I think from the variance standpoint, it's, it's a lesser impact. So I don't think a re-notice would be required. Now, I will give Mr. Costello the caveat that in connection with your redesign, if you create some new variance, then you're going to have to re-notice for the whole thing. So, so Janice, what's the date? Or where, where are we going with this? Well, I, I mean, the reason I'm debating this is because Highgate Hall has continually postponed their their hearings. So I think let's put it on the agenda for December. Uh, um, I say December sixteenth. Yeah, and and we'll see, because um, I, I have no guarantee that they will actually proceed with their application that evening. Mr. Costello, if if we go to December sixteenth, you should be, you should understand that there are a number of applications in front of you, and you may not be reached. But in fact, some of those applications may fall off, and then you may be reached. So if okay. you go to that date, you're just going to have to see where you are as it approaches. Okay, I, I I can be flexible. You know, we'd love to be on that date, and if it doesn't work out, we'll we'll get on the next one. Okay, okay. so Mr. Costello, let me ask you: Will you consent to an extension of time for the board to act until that December 16 date? Yes. So I think the board, someone from the board, should make a motion to carry this application to December 16, 2020, 7:30 p.m. Uh, the new virtual information to access the meeting will be on the the um, township's website. Um, there will be no further notice required unless additional uh, new variances are sought. Someone needs to make a note, make the motion. I'll make the motion. I'll, I'll make, hello? Yeah, yeah. Who's, it's, it's Jay, okay. Yeah, I'll make the motion. Second? Yeah, can we get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Thank Give you. Give us a motion to adjourn. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. And we're looking forward to our next meeting. We appreciate the feedback very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Have You're welcome. Motion to adjourn, please. Motion, motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Take care, Take care everybody. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night.